Написано 5, 6, 7, раз, два. Пять, шесть, семь, раз, два. Шесть, семь, раз, два, три, четыре.
5, 6, 7, раз, два. И, и, он, чу, раз, два. players from different countries in order to exchange information about recent trends in trade finance and most importantly make new friends and partners. We have an exciting afternoon ahead where we'll cover some of EBRD's and TFP's main priorities for the future, discuss trade finance in the region and conclude with the highly anticipated annual TFP awards ceremony. And of course um, with the dinner hosted jointly with our partner Odo BHF. I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, all the other sponsors of this event for their generous support and friendship. And now let me invite on the stage for the opening remarks our Managing Director for Financial Institutions, Francis Malish. Please join me, Francis. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nana. Thank you, colleagues. It's great to see so many familiar faces in the, uh, in the audience. And uh, 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 of course, welcome to the TFP conference here in, uh, in Samarkand. I'm, I'm sure you all know the old legend, uh, but for those of you who don't, let me take you back almost five centuries. Istanbul, 1541. A young and bright aide to Hashim Pasha, the Grand Vizier, to Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, walks in the streets of Istanbul when suddenly death stands before him. And death says, I'll meet you in a month's time. Frightened, the young man rushes to Suleiman and explains that he must leave, hide in the remotest corner of the empire, the city of Samarkand. 
Suleiman is touched by the distress and the loyalty of the young aide and gives him his best horse and grants permission to leave. Later that day, death shows up in the palace, appears before Suleiman and says, I came to see your young advisor. And the Sultan uh, retorts, ha, you won't see him. He's gone far away, or you won't find him. And I forbid you from taking my young aides. Why don't you take Hashim Pasha instead? He won't last as my vizier anyway. Des ignores him, ignores the instructions and the orders, and replies, I decide these things. Someday, I will come for you too. But the young man was gone so quickly this morning that I did not have the time to tell him where we'd meet next month. I will be waiting in Samarkand. So, welcome to the city where we all meet our destiny. For us, as a TFP community, these rendezvous are much more frequent and hopefully much less dramatic. But, contrary to the legend, I firmly believe that destiny is also something that we choose for ourselves. So let me tell you a few things that we choose. We choose to be at the service of the real economy. Trade is one of the oldest forms of finance available, and this particular group of people in this room plays a key role in keeping countries connected, especially the more fragile countries in this region. We choose green. Over the past year, the TFP has been asking you to develop financing of green transactions from scrap metal to wind farm spare parts to agricultural produce. And you have done it all. Thank you. We choose digital. I know some firms around the room are pioneering efforts to test and practice digital solutions for trade finance, and we will continue to support this. We choose Ukraine. We're proud to report that from February to December 2022, the EBRD enabled over 430 million euros of trade transactions for crucial goods for the Ukrainian economy. I'm proud to say that the Global Trade Review recently gave an EBRD-supported transaction for the import of agricultural equipment into Ukraine a Best Deal of 2022 award. It is an honor to have the spotlight on Ukraine and the vital work that our partners have undertook this past year. It came as a welcome surprise to us also to be awarded the Best Development Bank of 2022 during that ceremony. The TFP program also played an important role in addressing the global food crisis by facilitating over a billion in trade financing for food-related food commodities, fertilizers, and agricultural equipment. We also choose, I must say this to this audience, to be very careful when it comes to Russia. It is no mystery that we at EBRD have been the leading institution in supporting Ukraine. We are very keen to avoid that any of your banks could fall under secondary sanctions. And for that, I have to ask you to keep being very careful too, as you have been very successfully this year. We choose partnership with you. This partnership reconfirmed over the years underpins the success of the TFP program. We don't just trade together, we have your back, as today's panel about technical assistance continues to demonstrate. And finally, in counterpoint to this a little bit dark humor start, we choose growth and optimism. The TFP team's work is never ending and the demand for TFP products continues to grow. The program remains focused on keeping global trade moving. And in 2022, it achieved a record annual volume of 3.6 billion euros, surpassing the previous record of 3.2 billion in 2021. This record-breaking performance is a testament to the hard work and dedication of everyone involved in the TFP. Our destiny is to grow together. You can count on us. Thank you very much. And now I pass the floor to Odile Renaud Basso, the president of the EBRD. We're very, very happy to have you here, Odile. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends of the TFP. It's really a great pleasure for me today to welcome you here to our 
90th EBRD Trade Facilitation Program Information Session and Award Ceremony. For more than 30 years now, the bank has actively supported building open market economies and promoting private enterprises in former countries of the Soviet Union and more recently Middle East and North Africa. During all this period, we have invested more than 180 billion euros in more than 6,600 projects with TFP having an important role since its inception in 1999. In September of last year, EBRD moved into a new HQ in London, one of the most environmentally advanced buildings in the UK and in Europe, underlining our sustainability commitment. And in March of this year, this new HQ was officially opened by King Charles, who met with the bank senior management and staff, including that from Ukraine and Turkey, and who was very impressed by our green commitment and our commitment to Ukraine and exceptional support to Turkey. Today, the bank is not only a pioneer in the field of sustainable finance, but also the largest institutional investor in Ukraine. In 2022, under wartime conditions and responding to Ukraine's urgent need, in particular in relation to the real economies, we deployed 1.7 billion euros of investment and an additional 200 million from Partners Bank. This war on Ukraine has had a devastating impact on regional supply chains with issues of, with issues of food security becoming one of the biggest challenges together with energy security. And in 2022, the TFP facilitated over 1 billion euros in trade in Ukraine for the import and export of food, food-related commodities, fertilizers, and agricultural equipment alone. More recently, we announced plans to invest up to 1.5 billion in Turkey over the next two years to address the impact of the recent earthquakes in the country in which many lost their lives. The trade finance industry has shown great, great strength and determination in responding to these emergencies and keeping the wheels of international trade moving and therefore providing vital support uh, to these countries. International trade is essential for global economic growth, prosperity, but also world peace and it's vital that we continue to support it in the face of the challenges. I believe that we are here today because we all share a sense of community and a commitment to overcoming these events. The opportunity to gather in person in this historic and beautiful city of Samarkand provides a unique chance to further develop relationships and promote collaboration. I'm confident that the partnerships we have built, the relationships we have forged, and the collaboration we have fostered will continue to drive progress for the years to come. So thank you very much for your continued support of the EBRD Trade Facilitation Program and I look forward to an inspiring and productive event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Odile, for being with us. And now please welcome Representative Kelly She of the Taipei Representative Office in the UK on behalf of the Taiwan Business EBRD Technical Cooperation Fund, the TFP's longtime friend and supporter to the stage.
present audio and all Basso, uh, managing director Francis Malige, um, colleagues and partners of the trade facilitation program. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to join you in today's event and certainly to share uh, the thoughts and vision of, president, uh, of the president of the bank. I would like to take this opportunity to commend uh, the TFP team for achieving record high investment and transactions over the past year. Such results are even more significant considering the, time, uh, the trying times we're in. I'd like to uh, also extend my warmest congratulations to all the award winners um, on your excellent achievements. Now, since its launch in 1999, TFP has grown, in, grown to become one of the bank's most important and influential programs, supporting billions of uh, euros in trade across nearly all EBRD's countries of operation and improving the economic resilience and market competitiveness in the process. The Taiwan Business EBRD Technical Cooperation Fund has supported the TFP since its initiation. And as the donor of the fund, we take pride in our contribution to the bank's work, especially during times when the support is most needed. It is hard to fathom uh, that after a year, the war on Ukraine is still far from over. The ongoing uh, mayhem has caused major disruption in global supply chain. Business, businesses in Ukraine and neighboring countries were forced to face the brunt of the crisis. And the bank's role as a gap financier is crucial when the overall capital market has tightened. The TFP has helped to sustain the much needed trade flows across the EBRD region. As one of EBRD's major donors, we are, of course, pleased to see uh, our support making a meaningful impact. We're encouraged to see the bank's continued commitment to assist Ukraine. We're also dedicated to support Ukraine through our own channels and in collaboration with the bank. To date, Taiwan Business EBRD Technical Cooperation Fund and Taiwan ICDF have over the years jointly provided over 250 million US dollars in grants and con con uh, concessional finance, supporting hundreds of EBRD's projects. Many of our experts and talents have also took part in the, in the bank's project, sharing our knowledge and expertise in areas such as ICT, smart cities, and urban transportation. I'm optimistic that our cooperation with the bank will continue to reap rewarding results, and I look forward to our long-term uh, partnership. Finally, I would like to once again congratulate the TFP team on their outstanding achievements and to all award winners. I wish everyone a fruitful experience and continued success in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. And now welcome Dr. Rudolf Putz, EBRD's Head of Trade Facilitation Program, for his presentation. So, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, dear friends and business partners, yeah, I'm always happy to meet you at such an event because some of you we meet from only by telephone, some of you I meet you only uh, by video conference calls, but at least once a year we have a chance to meet also in person and to see and to see each other to exchange business cards. So it's really a pleasure to come together and I would like to use this opportunity not only to thank for sponsors and, and uh, for Taiwanese donors for organizing this event, but also my team, because all these achievements wouldn't have been able, we wouldn't have been able to achieve all this business and this growth of a business with the help of my team members. So. Uh, welcome, and uh, I'm very happy to meet with you. I would like to use this opportunity to give you a short survey about uh, the achievements of the TFP, what we are trying to achieve, what we have achieved, and what we are planning to do in future. So I will show you a few PowerPoint slides so that you all understand why we are here and what we are doing and what we are trying to do in future. Uh, as most of you know, 
uh, for trade facilitation program support financing of a whole supply chain from pre-export finance to product production finance, transport, storage and distribution up to the financing of receivables. So we are supporting the whole supply chain from the production to transport, storage and receivables and we offer support not only for traditional fi trade finance, not only for documentary credits, uh, but also for the development of factoring and supply chain finance in all our countries. Uh, we provide our partner banks in all our countries with guarantee facilities, with uh, cash facilities, and we support them also in the development of their receivables financing in the form of factoring and supply chain finance. Uh, the most, uh, the most uh, popular uh, part of our program are the TFP guarantee facilities under which we uh, guarantee the payment of an issuing bank to a confirming bank. And we're doing it only in cases when a confirming bank cannot take own risk on an issuing bank. Very often it happens that EBRD does the first transactions and then confirming banks can in future do transactions also without EBRD support. But currently, as mentioned before also by Francis, in, in crisis situations very often TFP guarantees are the only opportunity and only possibility for our partner banks to continue uh, business also in crisis situations as currently in Ukraine. Uh, in all our countries of operation, we have identified partner banks. Uh, we have uh, a, a list of partner banks who are ready to develop trade finance, who are ready to lend to their clients, who are ready to provide importers and exporters with financing facilities. And in Uzbekistan, we work with six banks, and we see these banks uh, on this list. And uh, banks in Uzbekistan, they have been long-standing business partners of the TFP. And when we started the trade facilitation program 23 years ago, banks in Uzbekistan were among the first banks who joined our program with very small limits. Uh, we provided them with technical assistance. And over the years, uh, the trade finance volumes of our partner banks have grown significantly. Uh, perhaps a case study. Uh, a, a, a typical example of a transaction which we have been financing under the trade facilitation program, uh, import of uh, textile producing machinery, in this case a textile dyeing machinery import from Turkey. Uh, a bank in Uzbekistan issues a letter of credit. Uh, the importer needs not only financing for the import, but also for post-import financing, for repayment of the investment. Uh, so the trade facilitation program guarantees for payment of a letter of credit with a tender of up to three years and guarantees for payment of an issuing bank to the confirming bank. And in this case, the transaction also supports, uh, is, is qualified as green uh, because it produces significant energy savings. So it's a good for investment for the producer of, of textiles uh, to save energy and financed under a guarantee facility of uh, EBID. We finance not only imports, but we support also exports from all our countries of operation. We encourage our partner banks uh, to provide support not only to importers, but also to exporters, and particularly also to interregional business. And here you see a, on the screen, you see an example of a transaction where we support an export of animal feed uh, from Uzbekistan into a neighboring country, into Tajikistan. And it's a nice example because in both cases, uh, the issuing bank and the confirming bank are based in an EBRD countries of operation, and they are using our facilities not only for imports from Western countries, but also for trade uh, between neighboring countries, in this case between Uzbekistan and, for, and Tajikistan. Another example of a transaction which is very popular now is import of agricultural equipment into Ukraine. Currently, it's very difficult for importers in Ukraine to get access to finance. Uh, there is uh, agriculture that needs constant investment. As you know, grain is one of the most important export items of Ukraine, and they can only export if they have machinery and equipment. And uh, this is a nice example of a transaction where EBRD guaranteed for import of mach agricultural machinery into, into Ukraine, and it was even awarded uh, for best deal of the year uh, by Global Trade uh, Review. It shows that uh, uh, for readers of GTR Review, uh, they highly appreciate EBRD support also in, in, difficult, in difficult times where banks in Ukraine have very problems to get refinancing lines from foreign correspondent banks. Over the years, the business volumes have grown. Uh, when we started this program 23 years ago, trade finance was actually EBRD's smallest product. 
Uh, we started with a small team of only three bankers. Now we have 20 bankers. The business volumes have grown and they continue to grow because we constantly add new partner banks. We constantly increase our limits. We provide technical assistance and this technical assistance helps our partner banks to increase business volumes uh, to uh, finance transactions not only with letters of credit but also with supply chain finance, with factoring and for this reason for business volumes uh, have grown. Every year we publish uh, a list of the most active users of our programs by country and uh, if you look at this list, Uzbekistan is number two by number of transactions. It shows that there is a really a need uh, for support of trade, finance uh, in any of these countries and particularly also in Uzbekistan where banks are ready to lend to importers and exporters but they still need guarantee cover uh, for letters of credit and bank guarantees which have been issued uh, by our partner banks uh, in Uzbekistan to foreign correspondent banks. Tunisia is number one. Uh, one of the reasons is because there is currently economic crisis in Tunisia. Many foreign correspondent banks are very cautious in taking own risk on our partner banks in Tunisia and they prefer to work with our correspondent banks in Tunisia only with 100% uh, EBRD cover. Ukraine is number five. Uh, Greece number four. Uh, I can tell you that uh, a few years ago uh, all transactions required cover by EBRD now uh, correspondent banks are ready to take own risk, but still banks in Ukraine are still using our program for financing of all their transactions. Every year we publish also a list of the most active confirming banks by number of transactions. And, uh, it's, and, and for confirming banks, of course, we follow for trade flows. There is a lot of trade flows from Europe to our countries of operation. So it's not surprising that confirming banks in Austria, Germany and Italy are the most active users of our program. Um, and it's not only large banks, it's also medium-sized banks that are specialized in trade finance. And a nice example is Auto BHF Bank, a medium-sized bank in Germany, very specialized in trade finance. And it shows that on this list you see not only large banking groups, uh, but also medium-sized banks who are specialized in trade finance and use our facilities for own lending to importers and exporters in all our countries of operation. Increasingly, uh, we see a tendency that a lot of cross-border trade is not being financed anymore by letters of credit, uh, but also by open account. And a good opportunity for supporting for development of open account is also for development of factoring. So we support now our partner banks also in the development of factoring activities, in the development of supply chain finance. And uh, in cross-border business, you always have an import factor and an export factor. And very often an export factor is ready to take risk only on an, uh, on an import factor if a payment risk and for cover bank risk is covered by a guarantee. And we use our facilities now also to cover for payment risk of import factors to export factors. A nice example shown on this screen is a transaction between, uh, between Georgia and Armenia. Uh, there is an export, there is an export uh, from Georgia uh, to Armenia. Uh, for export is financed by an, an export factor, for import by an import factor. And uh, the export factor in Georgia uh, required a guarantee of EBRD in order to take the payment risk of an import factor. So it shows that our facilities work not only for documentary credits, but also for cross-border uh, factoring business. Uh, we work together with uh, all institutions, with commercial banks, but we also work together with co-financing partners, because very often our own facilities are not sufficient to cover all risk. Uh, in some countries we need support from co-financing partners and I want to use this opportunity also to thank our co-financing partners for taking part of our risk and uh, this year we have signed a, a, a co-financing facility with MIGA, uh, a world, part of a World Bank group who are ready to share part of our risk in Ukraine because the business volumes are so large that our own facilities are not sufficient in order to take all risk ourselves. Our priorities under the program is not only to support trade, but also particularly flows of trade. We have decided to stop all uh, transactions and support for all transactions of carbon fuel. Uh, no more fossil fuels. The only exception currently is Ukraine, where we still have to support the import of, of, of diesel for the agriculture. But otherwise, we have stopped financing and guaranteeing imports and exports of uh, fossil fuel. Instead, we are 
trying to convince our partner banks to use our facilities for import and export of green and energy sufficient and energy saving machinery and equipment. And we also support all our partner banks in the development of digitalization. As you know, trade finance is a paper-based business, but we try to support all our partner banks also in digitalizing for trade finance business. Green TFP. Uh, under these facilities, uh, we help our partner banks by cash advances and by guarantee facilities to support more green transactions, more import of uh, transactions that are good for climate change adaptation and uh, safe energy and uh, are good for environment. So all transactions that support uh, the development of green technologies are always getting preference under our trade facilitation program. We provide our partner banks not only with financing facilities, guarantee facilities, and cash facilities, but also with training courses, uh, with advisory services, and policy dialogue, which is important in order to uh, facilitate the business by transfer of knowledge, but also of political support by central banks and banking supervisory authorities. A part of our activities is providing not only advisory services and training face-by-face, -face, but we have also digitalized our business. We are providing uh, e-learning courses, uh, and we use material developed by the International Chamber of Commerce and also by, by FCI in order to help our partner banks to get access to knowledge. This is particularly important now for, for factoring and supply chain finance. We are planning uh, to roll out a big program where we support training courses and advisory services to the providers of factoring and supply chain finance facilities. We have had over more 9,000 bankers already using our training programs, and uh, more than 7,000 have even finished our training programs. It shows that our cooperation with the ICC and FCI has been successful, and more and more of our partner banks have, have got access uh, to knowledge in trade finance and factoring and receivables financing. Um, every year we organize also award ceremonies and the graduation ceremonies. We are very popular among the e-learning students. Many e-learning students, we get together, get the certificates and are motivated to use the knowledge also uh, for the financing of trade and factoring and receivables financing. But I do not yet want to finish my presentation without telling you that we have, will have a joint event uh, tomorrow uh, with FCI. Uh, where we invite all our partner banks to join us. It will take place tomorrow. Uh, and um, you may have already got an, an invitation to f join us for this event. And it's interesting for our partner banks to get access uh, to understand how factoring works, how supply chain finance works, and how trade can fi be financed not only by documentary credits, but also by factoring and receivables financing solution. Tomorrow, a joint event with FCI. And uh, on Thursday, we will have another joint event uh, with uh, International Trade and Forfeiting Association, uh, where we will uh, provide uh, our partner banks uh, with uh, additional knowledge and how to uh, use supply chain finance solutions to finance uh, trade. That brings me the end, uh, to the end of my presentation, but I would like to uh, inform you that this evening we will have a dinner. The dinner has been sponsored by one of the most active confirming banks under the trade facilitation program. It's Auto BHF Bank. Auto, Auto BHF Bank has been a long-standing partner under the trade facilitation program, and we highly appreciate this cooperation with Auto BHF Bank because we are ready to provide uh, trade finance facilities also to smaller banks and to smaller countries. And we find it increasingly difficult to find correspondent banks for smaller banks in smaller countries. And although BHF Bank have made a special effort uh, to follow us also to the most difficult countries to establish guarantee facilities also for very small banks and in, high, in, high, in difficult markets. And today if we will finance our, if we will celebrate our joint achievements with a dinner which has been sponsored by other BHF Bank. So we are very looking forward to meeting you also at our dinner this evening. I, I hope I have given you a survey about our activities and achievements under the trade facilitation program, a better understanding what we want to achieve. And we will now have several panels where we will invite some of our most active partner banks, issuing banks, and confirming banks to share experience with you so that you can see how the program has been working in, in practice, uh, that these facilities are not, not only established, but they are also actively utilized. And I'm looking forward to our first panel. Uh, and the first panel will be uh, moderated by my colleague, uh, by my colleague Olga,
who is heading our trade facilitation program in Central Asia. And I'm now asking Olga to come to the stage and together with some panelists and give us a short survey about her important work and what has been achieved under our trade facilitation program in Central Asia. So I wish you uh, a pleasant afternoon. I hope to meet with you uh, latest today in the evening at the dinner and uh, also in the next days with the joint seminars which we will organize with FCI and with uh, the International Trade and Forfeiting Association. So, Olga, please come to the stage. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I hope you can hear me. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Olga Kompanyits. I'm the principal banker of the BRD Trade Facilitation Program, and I would like to welcome you to the first panel of the day that will discuss the development of trade finance in the beautiful uh, regions that are proudly hosting the BRD annual meeting this year. This is Central Asia and the Caucasus. In these two regions combined, our trade facilitation program is present in nine countries, that is Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Mongolia, Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan. Um, this is in two regions combined, the BRD trade facilitation program has uh, 70, uh, not 70 yet, uh, 30 issuing banks. Um, and limits close to 700 million US dollars across nine countries and 30 banks. And the limits keep growing, which points out to the BRD growing importance for both regions. Um, at the panel today, Central Asia and the Caucasus are represented by four countries. Armenia, Uzbekistan, thank you. <laughs> Tajikistan, Georgia, and uh, one of the most active confirming banks in, the, in both regions, ODBHF. Uh, dear panelists, let's start the discussion by a round of quick introductions. Personal introductions, let's make it real quick, because after all, we are all a family over here, and almost everyone knows almost everyone. So quick personal introductions, followed by um, longer overview of the development of trade finance in your banks and countries, if you can. Uh, Tamara, the floor is yours. Georgia, please. Thank you, Olga. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank EBRD for organizing this uh, conference. And uh, in my point of view, the uh, location was, um, uh, was chosen amazing location, very nice. And uh, I'm first time in Uzbekistan, in Samarkand, and uh, it was like, I'm very impressed. So I think that uh, the, look, uh, the uh, events like this are very important because we have a chance to meet each other and uh, uh, share our experiences, uh, our uh, best practices, also, we have a good chance to discover new cultures, new cities, and, um, and uh, meet uh, new people. And I think that EBRD, Trade Finance, have, uh, has been doing a great job with these conferences that a big uh, Trade Finance community now is a big family where everybody knows each other and supports each other. Uh, I'm Tamara Hizanishvili, and I'm thrilled to introduce myself um, as a head of trade finance and factoring department at uh, TBC Bank. Um, I had the privilege to uh, uh, witnessing and uh, dedicating uh, and uh, uh, contributing a lot uh, in the uh, trade finance development in my country and uh, in this dynamic uh, sector. TBC Bank is the number one bank in the country. 
and I have a great proud of being uh, part of this bank. Our com commitment to excellence and uh, also customer satisfaction uh, has helped us to, secu to secure our, um, uh, our very impressive uh, market share, which is 49% in trade finance and we are very proud of it yes really because we are like a market maker in trade finance um, in tbc bank we understand that uh, trade finance uh, is a uh, is uh, playing a critical role in um, uh, development of economy uh, in, um, in in uh, stimulating economy and also supporting the uh, companies we are dedicated to offer um, comprehensive uh, suite of services and the products like letters of credit, different types of guarantees. We also offer factoring and reverse factoring, documentary credit, so all types of documentary business uh, products. Our goal has always been to, um, uh, to offer and uh, provide the clients um, the um, uh, innovative solutions and also tailored solutions because uh, in our dynamic world it's important to be uh, very flexible and uh, also meet the requirements of the clients. Um, in uh, terms of trade finance, these uh, last two years were very, very impressive in terms of increasing of trade operations and uh, in, two, in 2022 operations increased by 42 percent i mean the newly generated transactions which was like a, uh, i should say the uh, the very high uh, increase in in our operations since um, 2016. Um, the uh, trade finance increased by uh, almost 210 million us dollars and the number of operations are also increased significantly. We had in 2021 only 3,500 transactions, but in 2022, um, 4,500, which is 27% more uh, than increase in year on year in year. And twen uh, 2023, first quarter also, um, also started with quite significant growth and year on year the increase is about 25%. So in our country, uh, trade operations are, ha have the dy uh, in, uh, growth dynamic. So this is what I can <laughs> tell you in short, shortly. <laughs> Thank you, Tamara. Thank you, Tamara. This is very impressive. Let's now move to Armenia and see if, if Armenia can beat it. Angelo, over to you. <laughs> the, the development of trade finance in your bank. My name is Angela Bartagan. Um, currently, I hold the position of Trade Finance and uh, Correspondent Relationship uh, Department, uh, uh, Department Director at Armsys Bank. Um, our bank is a corporate and investment bank, which is pretty actively invo involved in trade finance business. And uh, designing and developing trade finance products have always been one of our priorities. And we have uh, already uh, uh, collaborating with uh, either financial, international financial institutions or uh, foreign banks in this uh, area. And uh, we have recorded quite a lot of success in trade finance uh, business, uh, for, uh, received a number of awards. Particularly, we have been awarded by the EBRD for four times in a row as the most active issuing bank in Armenia, uh, two times by ADB as a leading partner in Armenia and once uh, by FCI for the best deal of the year. Uh, well, actually, we were uh, not an exception, and uh, 2022 was an extraordinary year for us also, and it had its negative effect on our trade finance business in Armenia as well, and in, uh, we had uh, some decrease in 2022, and uh, uh, in uh, our transactions volume for 2022, it comprised to around 60 million US uh, dollars and with uh, 40 active clients and around 300 uh, transactions included. What about for 2023 as um, trade finance business um, suffers a lot due to compliance requirements and uh, Western banks are becoming more selective. Uh, we are uh, a bit cautious about our perceptions, about our expectations for 2023, but anyway, we, uh, we move forward and we do our best uh, to develop our products and business. Thank you, Angela, for, for sharing 
the stance of trade finance business and arms with, arms with Bank Armenia. We have a representative of one of the most active banks in Uzbekistan, Mir Said, with us. Could you please give us your perspective? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mir Said Hadith, the head of the corresponding banking relations from Asaki Bank. Uh, so the trade finance in our bank is very uh, uh, main product of our banks <coughs> and yearly turnover is more than the 1.3 billion US dollars uh, and <coughs> the trend is going only for the increasing of the product year by year because uh, the bank is uh, offering these product all types of DTF products uh, to its clients very actively Actually, uh, the bank is the, uh, listed in the list uh, for uh, banks of the country, so, uh, but even if we are on the first uh, um, place, but uh, we are the leading bank uh, for, on the trade finance business. Just me. Uh, brief, but sweet. Yeah. So, also an increasing trend in ah. the field of trade finance. Yeah. Uh, if you wish, I can add. Uh, Firuza, please, uh, perspective of Ishata Bank, Tajikistan. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank EBRD because they choose the right location. It's uh, really great because I am very happy to hear uh, my language in the street because uh, uh, Tajik language is my uh, mother language. That's why I'm very happy. Uh, my name is Firuza Khotamova. I'm Senior Specialist, Trade Finance Operations Unit, uh, SME and Corporate Business Department, Bank Eshata, Tajikistan. My experience uh, in the field of trade finance is over 15 years old. Bank Eshata is the main three top banks in Tajikistan who is developing and innovative bank and the largest private bank, uh, retail bank, which plays an important role in the development of the country's economy and maintain the public confidence in the banking system. Bank Eshata was the first bank in Tajikistan who signed an agreement with TFP program in 2004. IBRD TFP program helps a small business understand how, uh, how trade finance instrument uh, offered by our bank uh, can reduce the risks involved in foreign trade and uh, and uh, maintaining public confidence in the banking system. Uh, thanks to TFP, uh, Bank Eshata and our client has got the several benefits. First, we have got contact uh, from 30 uh, confirming banks from 10 countries to conduct mostly LC with confirmation, uh, which secured our clients from not receiving of import goods from the new supplier. The second, uh, this allow, allowed not only receiving importing goods from new supplier, but it is also expanded our potential uh, corresponding bank partners. Then uh, the number of these confirming bank uh, had begun to work with us uh, in the opposite direction, for example, on advising uh, exporting letter of credits, for example, Banca Popolare de Sandrio, uh, Hamkor Bank, uh, Uspromstroy Bank, and Asaka Bank. Thank you, Firuza. Zuzan, over to you. Could you please give us a confirming bank's perspective on the region, Central Asia, and the Caucasus, and probably focusing on the countries that are represented at the panel? Thank you very much, Olga. So, good afternoon to everyone. So, I'm very happy to be here. So, my name is Susanna Franz. I am representing Franco German privately owned banking group, Odo BHF, located so in Germany. So, we are based in Germany, in France, and Switzerland. As Rudolf already mentioned, so uh, 
We are long-standing partners so, uh, to EBRD from the beginning of TFP, and we are very thankful to be the partner of the EBRD. Uh, I am heading one of the sales teams, and among other, I am also responsible for Central Asia and South Caucasus, which means countries which are representing also on this panel. And I'm very proud to say so that every bank so which is here on the panel so belongs to our clients. And what we are doing, so as I said, privately owned, family owned bank, our balance sheet is not the biggest one, not comparable with some global banks, but as for the trade finance, so this belongs to our DNA. And uh, we are very proud to say so that we have a, in Germany market share of about 10% in documentary business, and we have number, we are number three after two big global banks. What we are doing in the region, we are increasing business. This is something so which I am also very proud to say. Because uh, if you look at the global political situation, there are some markets where we so cannot work anymore. So looking uh, at the uh, Russian invasion into Ukraine. And we see that also our clients, European companies, they are somehow redirected. So their exports and they are looking for new markets. And especially Central Asia and the South Caucasus countries are profiting out of this situation. And if our clients are going to these countries, we are following them. And that means so that we were able to increase the business in Armenia, in Georgia, in Azerbaijan. We were able to onboard new partners. And we are also growing so in the Central Asia, Uzbekistan. We have 13 banks with whom we work in Uzbekistan. In Kazakhstan, we are trying to expand right now. And also, we are looking at a smaller market like uh, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan at the moment. That's short of the introduction. Thank you, Susanna. It's good to hear that your business in the region, Central Asia and the Caucasus, is growing. So is TFP business. And good to know that that's the case. We are both complementary. Tamara, over to you. You mentioned that um, TBC Georgia trade finance business did boom in 2022. Uh, what were the factors behind um, the boom of the business? Maybe some new products, uh, what was the driving force behind the growth? Uh, uh, during the last 12 months, the demand on trade finance products were influenced, to have been influenced by different factors. And um, that factors including, and not limited to, first of all, that was the end of the pandemic that businesses started doing uh, business more actively. On the other hand, uh, it was the um, Russian aggression against Ukraine, uh, which was also, uh, it, it, ha it has also a big impact on the supply chain, uh, supply, uh, supply chains, which was established before and now everything is changing. Um, then mounting sections that we have, fluctuation of commodity prices. So all this impacted positively or negatively on demand of the trade finance products. Uh, on the Georgian side, what I can say that we are market maker on the, uh, in Georgia, therefore I can speak from the uh, whole market uh, more or less. So um, the main impact was the increase of uh, very small transactions. And because we are more focused on um, sanctions, um, therefore, and compliance issues, uh, we uh, started uh, offering the clients, instead of ad, uh, pay advance payments, to uh, focus more on, on small trade finance deals like letters of credit, to be more on safe side from the best bank's perspective as well as from the client's perspective, because we can then uh, monitor and check transactions from its origination to its end. Uh, so the documentation are provided uh, for payment, so we are sure that everything is uh, complied with uh, the regulations and in, uh, regulations that we have in the country or internationally. So um, the, um, what is important that SMEs started 
doing business more in trade finance. Before it was more corporate business, but now in numbers, if we compare with small transactions, now SME business increased significantly. And this is small transactions like for uh, from 10,000 to uh, 70,000 letters of credit, and especially those letters of credit goes to, go to uh, uh, Asia. And uh, that's, I think, that likely because of the volatility of the market, uncertainties, and uh, the uh, documentary um, uh, operations are um, uh, providing the security and ensure that uh, for insurance for both exporters and importers, and also the banks involved, because we can track and monitor the transactions. And this, in this world, in this volatile world, in this uncertainty, I think that this is time to, for us to educate the clients and, uh, pro and offer them very flexible uh, products that we can do for small amounts, but ensure that we are comply with sanctions. And at the same time, clients are uh, secure and uh, get benefit from the LCs uh, that uh, can do for the importer or exporter. That's what we have. Thank you, Tamara. So thank you for doing the work with your clients to switch them from advanced payment to documentary credits. Um, end of pandemic, supply chains, redirection, commodity prices increase were the other factors you mentioned that contributed to the growth of trade finance business line at TBC Georgia. Angela, you mentioned that at Arms with Bank Armenia, the, the trend was, was not the upward one. What were the reasons behind it last year? <clears throat> last year. It was, uh, the trend, uh, I will start with uh, positive factors, okay. maybe. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, there, uh, the first factor I would like to mention, um, which uh, influenced the demand uh, for trade finance products, uh, uh, was uh, green financing. Overall, there is uh, growing interest in our green financing in Armenia, and uh, many sustainable projects have been uh, supported through financial instruments. And uh, green financing wa is one of our priorities as well, and Arms Swiss Bank has a great experience in, in it, and that's why in 2020 Arms Swiss Bank was uh, selected as an implementing party for a grant program initiated by GCF, Green Climate Fund. And uh, so, so there, uh, we had a number of uh, industrial scale solar projects where um, uh, for trade finance tools have been used mostly. The second factor that uh, um, influenced, uh, uh, I would like to mention, that is worth to mention, is um, there are two programs initiated by the government of Armenia for economy modernizing, uh, economy modernizing program and uh, agricultural equipment leasing pro uh, programs, which uh, where the government um, uh, subsidizes the interest rate for leasing. Uh, the, and these two programs um, lead to uh, economic activity increase in Armenia, definitely. And all, in all these projects, were, uh, which were financed by Arms Swiss Bank, we um, uh, made all, all this uh, uh, import of equipment from uh, abroad through letters of credit. So these were the uh, positive factors. But for example, for export financing, um, uh, for pre-export financing or post-export financing, which we uh, used to do uh, back to, uh, using the uh, policies of Export Insurance Agency. Uh, in these products, we uh, mentioned uh, a decrease. Uh, this was uh, uh, in part of export to Russia. As uh, you know, uh, Russia is uh, appearing to be one of the um, main partners of, of Armenia. That's why in this uh, uh, part we had decreased so the, due to um, uh, compliance requirements. So, Thank you, Angela, for sharing your view. Uh, Mir Said, over to you. The perspective of Asaka Bank Uzbekistan. Latest trends on the development of trade finance business yes. line. If you look back only uh, to the last year, or more uh, like three years, the trend is growing up uh, stably, like between 10% yearly. And uh, but even if the total volume is uh, like about 10%, the amount of the transactions are growing up because uh, we, I rem we remember that the, in the beginning uh, we used to be the 
like uh, government support bank. So uh, we have had many corporate clients, and now we are more oriented to the SME clients. That's why the uh, amount of the tra transactions are being like uh, less, but the uh, uh, the volume is like being less, but the uh, amount is more year by year. And the another uh, one more option is that the the population of the country is growing up, and that's why the demands to the import and uh, import uh, products are also uh, grow, uh, growing up like simultaneously. And one more point I would add: I would like to add that uh, before the country was used to export its um, sources like raw materials just for the export. Now uh, we are more oriented to prepare the ready-made uh, products. That's why more, many equipments last year, uh, I saw the transactions uh, which were imported the uh, equipments under the traditional like LCs. So that's why uh, we are more, um, the trend is uh, on whole going up. Thank you, Mercedes. Firuz, over to you, Tajikistan. Uh, since December 2022, uh, uh, with the support of EBRD, our bank started to develop two new products of TFP program. This is trade loans and factoring financing. With the help of EBRD, we have got consultant who is working hard with us during six months for developing the popular TFP programs uh, products such as LC confirmation and post financing, trade loans, banking guarantees, indirect and indirect guarantees too. Currently, new product in banking market of Tajikistan is under the process of start. This is local factoring. Together with EBRD's consultant, we have made much jobs with creditor and debitor who will be under the pilot of this project. Besides, uh, our consultant trained all of the staff who will be involved in the process of factoring. He advises us to reconsider our internal procedures and process of TFP production uh, products, namely back office responsibilities, tasks, and duties. Uh, EBRD's consultant assistant has a greatly meaning for further development TFP program in our bank, and it was very high value. And one more uh, new product is close to uh, be launched, uh, confirming bank agreement, where Bank Eshata will be the first bank in Tajikistan to graduate from TFP issuing to TFP confirming bank. Confirming bank agreement will allow Bank Eshata to, feel, to fulfill his strategy to become a bank to bank in Tajikistan. This strategy evolves around provision of various type of service, banking services, including confirmation, uh, confirming bank services to a smaller bank in Tajikistan who lack access to corresponding banking network. So the role of confirming bank will help as harder increase access of Tajik banks to docu documentary trade finance in the country. This is very important um, for bankers Hada, and we are working with IBRD consultant and with IBRD TFP to make it in reality. Thank you, Firuza. Firuza came well prepared. She answered the question which I have not yet asked. Mm -hmm. uh, but <laughs> so before we cover this question for Armenia, Uzbekistan, and Georgia, Zuzana, may I please have your um, uh, helicopter view of a confirming bank that is working in both regions on the latest trends and the development of trade finance that you've seen over the last 12 months, the main trends? Yeah. So 
as we are now here, so it's um, uh, TFP, so then I concentrate, of course, uh, on the trade finance uh, products, but I would like to mention also what we uh, see as a tendency is coming from the market. So as a, for the trade finance, so we see, so there is the documentary business, standard documentary business. So we see also the, from some countries the, uh, as a relatively new product guarantees coming. So uh, unfunded transactions, standby LCs. Uh, and what we also see, so this is not a part of the EBRD program, so, but I would like to mention it because I mean, so that's also mirroring the market. We see also the demand, especially from uh, Central Asia for the long-term financing for the import of investment goods. So, or the export into the Central Asia. So, and this long-term financing, there are either possibilities to do it under TFP, so especially if the transactions are green, so we are very thankful to IBRD so that uh, the tenors are extended up to five years for green transactions uh, for uh, TFP, but even so, uh, so if the transaction tenor so is required even longer than five years, so then we are going for ECA option, export credit agency coverage, we see this business, grow, business growing, and what is also of interest and the trend which we see especially here in Uzbekistan is that uh, the most business so which we uh, have seen during the last let's say five six years there were transactions with banks now some Uzbek corporates are trying to uh, uh, get the direct coverage within the involvement of the banks so the direct coverage under the ECA business and of course, we see the treasury transactions. So many banks from the region are highly liquid. They are placing deposits with us. And we see, of course, the very, very big demand for cash services, for payments. So this product so is also something so which we are looking at. So uh, of course, selectively, so we are starting with trade finance, but for our longstanding partners, so we are opening new correspondent accounts and uh, we have done it also for the banks from this region. Thank you, Zuzana. Uh, Tamara, maybe you can walk us uh, through the new products that TBC is developing, has developed, is planning to develop. Okay. Uh, I will give word to Angela because okay. you know Angela. that we did this transaction together <laughs> and uh, um, already Rudolf uh, presented these transactions very well. We are very proud of this transaction and Angela will start because she was, uh, she was initiator, I should say, of these transactions and I will ask her to start. <laughs> thank you, thank you for giving the floor to me. So the transaction uh, I'm going to talk about, um, it was the first um, intra-regional cross-border factoring uh, um, transaction which, uh, where, where e uh, EBRD is, um, trade finance facilitation technologies were, have been used. So let me I I briefly introduce uh, uh, what we did. Uh, we had a client who, which uh, is engaged in um, chocolate production and they used to import um, cocoa mass from a, Georgian co from a company located in Georgia and they used to work with 100% prepayment and then they uh, tried, uh, applied to us uh, to decided to switch to letter of credit and applied to us for issuing a letter of credit. But uh, when they applied to us, we realized that this case is a typical case for uh, import factoring and we decided to contact our clients from TBC Bank in Georgia in order to understand whether they uh, are ready to cooperate with us in uh, this transaction. So when uh, we uh, applied to uh, them, there, uh, there we faced a problem. Uh, it's, uh, those, uh, the, the, both of our banks appear to be FCI uh, members, and, but, but we did not have any relationship uh, uh, with each other before and uh, it meant that some time would be needed for TBC Bank to establish a clean line on Arms Swiss Bank, but unfortunately we did not have this, uh, uh, time and the clients were not going to wait for it. So we found a solution and we applied to e e EBRD to issue a standby LC in favor of Arms Swiss Bank so that TBC Bank could uh, accept our 
uh, credit risk and finance their exporter uh, as soon as they deliver the goods. Uh, though the process um, was, uh, of negotiations was quite challenging because we had to provide um, the smooth change of product, also we had to keep the pricing affordable for our clients, um, but we succeeded and the uh, tra uh, tra uh, product is w working perfectly now. We have uh, revised the limit twice and we have uh, managed to issue uh, about 20 guarantees in frames of this product. Uh, in an item added that in result of this uh, transaction now um, uh, a relationship between the buyer and supplier uh, has moved to another level of cooperation. Uh, the buyer now has 120 days uh, deferred payment uh, period for paying the supplier, but the, at the same time the supplier has a uh, possibility uh, to uh, has an access to. Um, liquidity without providing any collateral or financial so, uh, for, the, for it. So uh, all parties of this transaction are happy and all of them benefited a lot of this. Can I add only a few words from the, from the exporters' uh, point of view? And we, were the, we are the export, exporters. Uh, what was the main uh, challenge that the client wanted to get paid immediately, our client, upon exporting the goods, and, uh, uh, and the Armstrong Bank's client wanted to pay uh, later. Uh, and you know the distance between Georgia and Armenia is very short. Therefore, LC won't, uh, d didn't work because uh, goods already arrived the documents, before documents present. So it's, it's not an, uh, it, it, it's, it's it was not an option. Therefore, we decided that uh, factoring should be a good option because uh, the client, our client shouldn't uh, uh, pay too much attention to documentation because uh, it's um, easier to present documents under just export rather than on a LC. Therefore, it's, that was a great, uh, great uh, solution. International factoring plus EBRD participation. Why we are the participation? You know that uh, when uh, we are speaking about factoring, receivables uh, ra uh, rating is very m important. And with EPRD participation, receivables rating improved credit rating. Uh, you know that it's triple A uh, rated bank. Therefore, the pricing, uh, pricing was decreased significantly, which allowed us to finance client with affordable rate. That was ma very important, IFI's participation. And factor system, because uh, both of us, export and importer bank, we can uh, we, we uh, service our client with good terms. Thank you, Tamara and Angel. It's great news, actually, for, the, for both regions that Armenia and Georgia pioneered the first cross-border factoring transaction in the regions with the support of EBRD TFP. Um, any other new product developments that you would like the audience to know about, Tamara, on TBC side? From our side, we started, uh, as uh, Firuza mentioned, we started uh, confirmations okay. and uh, we were the first time we in confirming bank list as one of the active <laughs> confirming banks because we were confirming not only Armenian transactions but Uzbekistan transactions exporting pharmaceuticals from Georgia to Uzbekistan. So it's, it's, it's very uh, interesting to be on a confirming bank side uh, because uh, you, it's, it's, it's quite a challenge to be uh, honest because you should take a quite a um, responsibility in checking of documents and provide financing and all these transactions are providing trans uh, financing with discounting or post financing which is also quite challenging and in all, all the time we are using EBRD uh, because um, it's uh, the same improving of the quality of asset which allows us to provide um, good pricing. Another piece of great news that TBC mm -hmm. graduated from the issuing bank to confirming bank and is now doing business in the region. Funding is a challenge, but we'll come to that a bit later. Mir Said, Asaka Bank, Uzbekistan, any new products you would like the audience to know about? 
that yes. you are working on. Uh, now, as colleagues uh, mentioned, uh, so I see, I thought we are the leading uh, on pro offering new products uh, on trade finance business, but I see already some of our good colleagues managed uh, to go forward. So actually, the Asaki Bank have been offering uh, many uh, Main types of the trade finance programs, uh, trade finance products to its clients, like uh, traditional LCs, uh, confirmed and confirmed, deferred payment or discounting, and the, the uh, import. Uh, the most of the the main of them is the post financing. So, except of this, uh, uh, this uh, I would say that these are more oriented to the import-oriented clients of the bank. But uh, we also began supporting the uh, exports of our clients. That's why we also we, we have had some allocate limits to our correspondent banks on the export LCs. But last year we have we also have signed the confirming bank agreement with EBRD, and we also have managed to make some transactions in the framework of this agreement. And. One more thing that uh, we have had card business. So uh, for the credit cards, we have had uh, deposit, uh, which was like a pledge uh, staying on the account of the that business card company. So we are now uh, changing it to the EBR the uh, guarantee uh, to the guarantee of the um, first class bank under the guarantee of the EBRD, under the cover of the EBRD. So and. Uh, last time, uh, we are also, we also began making the trade loans because trade loans is more, being more popular. Uh, but I think these are the uh, main points. Thank you, Mercy. So we've heard among the products that are developing in both regions, trade loans, confirming bank agreements whereby uh, representatives from the banks act as confirming banks. Um, factoring was another product that was discussed and conversion of cash deposits placed in favor of credit card companies into um, a guarantee under uh, EBRD cover to release liquidity. So these are the main products that are developing in both regions. Um, now we are actually out of time but we have one more question to cover so I will give one minute to each of the panelists to walk us through the main challenges you see to the development of trade finance in your bank and in your country. Tamara, let's start with you as a okay. tradition. I, I will be short. Um, so I think that I will mention um, that those uh, challenges which uh, touches all the banks. These are increasing sanctions and regulations. Uh, the second is significantly increasing soft rate and euro libor, which uh, makes funding very, very expensive. And uh, in our country, in Georgia, we are losing competition to loans. I mean, uh, trade loans are and uh, post financing discounting are uh, losing competition with ordinary loans because in uh, we have better uh, funding locally than uh, we attract from outside from. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the first time that we have right now. And handling commissions of the LC, so that's uh, for, I mentioned that small transactions are uh, increased significantly, but for those small transactions, handling fees, one of fees, are killing. Uh, so the small transactions are, are killed both with these commissions. And that's what I have the challenges. And uh, I think that EBRD can help us in techni with technical support to increase uh, our um, so-called expertise in sanctions and compliance uh, because trade finance also affected uh, uh, quite heavily with, uh, with these regulations. On the other hand, I think that uh, digitalization of documentation, trade documentation, will be the relief from the um, uh, exaggerated commissions. Uh, for trade because it will be like data which will be checked by the uh, by the systems and uh, uh, this handling commissions will be decreased and I think that EBRD can also help to work with the governments because it's not an easy thing to digitalize all these shipping documents and it's not easy and it's uh, for the job for years but anyway we will come to that 
uh, in one day. So I think that EBRD can do this uh, these two great jobs for us, for banks. <laughs> Thank you, Tamara. Uh -huh. All well noted, Angela. Uh -huh. um, unfortunately, what Tamara mentioned, we also face all these challenges in our country. And I just would like to add uh, one more challenge. It's the lack of awareness about trade finance products. It, uh, about understanding the benefits and the risk mitigation mechanism products offer. And uh, we, in our turn, we uh, organize seminars for our clients with describing all these products, but uh, there is still a lot, uh, uh, a lot of work, much work to do in this area. Um, I, I do hope sometimes <laughs> there will be a time when we will have all our clients eager to work with trade finance products. Thank you, Angel. And there is a room for EBRD as well to play to increase the financial literacy of the corporates of Definitely. the whole of Central Asia and the Caucasus. Mir Said, any new challenges in addition to what has yes. already been mentioned? Yeah, I, I bet to join to the, to the <coughs> idea of uh, Angela because the same issue uh, we see with our client managers of the bank, so we still have the lack of the knowledge of the TF products uh, between our clients and the, uh, even our, our uh, client managers. So we also tried, we even hired the consultants from EBRD side that, uh, to make it uh, like <coughs> more popular. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, one challenge. The, another one is the cost of funding. Is, it is rising time by time and it is not, uh, I would say, unpredictable. That's why uh, trade finance uh, products are also getting more expensive. This way, and clients do not want to, uh, to make uh, trade finance um, <coughs> transactions and prefer more to just take a loan from the bank. And that's why I think, uh, I don't know, uh, this is, I think this is also one of the main challenges. Thank you, Mersay. This is actually the pro pro problem for us as well. So we see more and more clients having to preference debt finance versus trade finance for the reason being uh, the, the, the raising software and Eurobor reference rates. Uh, Zuzana, the last word from you as a confirming bank active in both regions on the challenges and barriers. So the challenges so in the trade finance especially. So my... Uh, Speakers or coll speaker colleagues so already mentioned so the most important points. So I therefore so I would not like to repeat them. So I just would like to make maybe some comments on them. So uh, since uh, February 2022, there have been more than 15,000 individual sanctions imposed on Russia, Belarus individual companies, banks, etc., etc. 15,000. We have to cope with this situation. We have to live in this situation. The business always finds the way and the trade always finds the way. We have to check the transaction. It's increasing the costs. It's uh, increasing the time, but we can do it. So, And we can do it very well if we all cooperate. If we have a cooperation, so from the side, not only the confirming bank, but also from the issuing bank side. So if the issuing bank is approaching us already with the pre-check transactions uh, and the questions which we are asking, they are all similar. And it is still possible to do business. It is still possible to transport goods via Russia but you have to know how is it possible and you have to check it and be transparent. So this is one big challenge, but I hope so that we will manage. The second big challenge, so which was mentioned, so and to this one, so I can't change it. So because we are facing since almost one year, so the increase of the interest rate, rates, which we have not seen so for decades. And we as the European bank, so we are refinancing ourselves so in euro and in US dollar, and we have the refinancing costs. And every week, so I'm getting from my treasury the overview, where is the Euribor, where is the term software, so where is the LIBOR, and the time of very cheap money coming from Europe, so 
to Central Asia or to Caucasus, this time does not exist anymore. So we can't do anything for that. So because the Euribor, so 12 months, is 3.70 something, so, and this is the basis for the refinancing where we can move, we can move with our margin, so, and then if the transaction is fully covered so, by EBRD or by another development bank, so please believe us, the, our margin as a, a confirming banks, they are not huge. We basically, so, covering our fixed costs, so, and we still have to earn something on that. So maybe there might be some room for, for improvement so on the side of the taking the risk. So I'm now looking so at the EBRD or maybe the representative of some other institutions. That might be some relief, but of course the risk has to be also paid for. There are the challenges and we also see the situation that on the certain markets the local liquidity so is cheaper than the liquidity coming from Europe, from the US, if you add the risk margin on that, so then, so the transaction so is not economically suitable anymore, so, and therefore, maybe we will move so just to uh, risk securing more to the standby LC business, more to the purely confirmation, we will see, but I'm quite optimistic, and as we see, especially from this region, the business growing, I, I'm sure that we will manage it. So. Thank you, Zosana. We heard your cry. We actually hear, hear it quite often, not only from you, but from all the other confirming banks we work with, and issuing banks as well, that reference rates increase. That's not a secret from 30 to 500 bips in the course of the last uh, year and a half. So uh, we heard your cry. To decrease the margins, we will uh, have to work on this. And uh, the other the barriers to the development of trade finance in the region, um, which I will not list uh, in the interest of time, thank you, panelists, for uh, listing them. Thank you for uh, your active participation and for sharing your views so generously. Thank you, the audience, for listening so faithfully. Thank you all. And uh, we are out of time, so it's time, really time, to move to the next panel of the day. Nana, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
отношения, потом один. Hello. I think I will try not to lose any more time and we will straight get to the point. <laughs> yeah. So I will also not uh, like spend time on the introductions because we really are short of time. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for staying with us. Um, this panel will discuss green finance and specifically will focus on the green trade finance. And I look forward to hearing from our partner banks about their experience, their understanding of sustainable finance and trade finance if possible. Um, so. I will start with Martina Zimmerl, uh, Head of Trade Finance at Raiffeisen Bank International. Please, Martina, please share with us your insights about the sustainable finance. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Martina Zimmerl. I'm heading trade finance at RBI. And I have to tell you a secret. Five years ago, I didn't have a clue about green finance and ESG topics. And today I'm sitting here and discussing with you the strategy of the bank in green finance. And I'm proud to say that I have developed an ESG strategy even for trade finance, my department. So from my, my words, you understand already this is a development. It is a process. It has come from the top. It was uh, a strategic development that was defined by our board. But now it has cascaded down into each single operational unit, be it the risk management who defines the ESG ratings uh, and the criteria for financing, be it the product departments, be it business. Um, and what does green finance mean to us? It means a lot. For us, it's not a strategic buzzword, but it has become part of the way we act and think. Um, and we have developed into that a few years back. We have started with thinking about our real estate portfolio, uh, namely in addition to future cash flows and the balance sheet, we were thinking about the energy classification uh, of the real estate transactions that we were financing. This was the starting point, and then we started developing sectoral strategies, a policy on coal, a policy on oil and gas. And I have to say that with the EU agenda to become carbon neutral with 2050, this gave us an additional boost, and that's why I'm able to say that um, as of today, um, each department of the bank has um, adopted an ESG um, strategy also in the product offering and in the risk management. As of today, we are the largest green bond issuer in Austria. We are the first bank in Austria that has subscribed to the uh, UN principles of responsible banking. We are committed to the science-based targets to avoid greenwashing. We offer ESG advisory, uh, for instance, uh, to Usbromstoy um, uh, Bank. Uh, and uh, we are the first Austrian bank that is incentivizing ESG transaction. And how are we doing that? By disincentivizing the non-ESG portfolio. So we have even inputted the ESG topic into our controlling rules and are making ESG transactions in terms of contribution margin more attractive mm -hmm. to be sold and the, all of the other portfolio is less attractive. Um, and as mentioned, we have um, in each of the products, uh, we, have, um, we are able to offer an ESG um, uh, product offering. And I've mentioned to you that I myself five years ago couldn't have told you anything about um, uh, green finance and ESG. And I can tell you in five years ahead the road, this topic again will be different for us because we will be progressing. That's why it's a development and um, we are obviously struggling with certain topics like uh, assessing the CO2 impact um, of our portfolio that is uh, not uh, green, um, of getting data and so on. Yeah? But I can tell you in five years um, uh, down the road, I will be able to tell you other achievements. So that's in a nutshell for the bank. Thank you. Thank You're you so welcome. Uh, Dimitris, I'm moving <laughs> on to you. Um, Senior Director, um, Piraeus Bank, Greece. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, let me extend a thank you to EBRD for hosting us in this uh, great venue here in uh, Samarkand. Uh, as Martina said, it's a, it's a very dynamic sector. I mean, uh, green finance and sustainable finance, ESG finance, Paris Aligned Finance. I mean, you do have four or five different definitions that you have to follow in order to be in the business. 
It's a very dynamic sector. It's uh, it started a few years ago. It was everybody dar everybody's darling till two or three years ago. Then the pandemic came and we had to slow down a bit. As uh, Pyros Bank, we started this journey, I would say, around 2007, 2008, creating the first green banking products, as we used to call them at the, at the time. Now we see ourselves as pioneers in the Greek market. We have a portfolio of uh, around 600 million sustainability-linked loans from the past uh, two years. Uh, we have uh, also issued a green bond uh, around 18 months ago and we see following this trend in the next years. We also are one of the biggest lenders in uh, renewable energy sources. We have a little over two billion in uh, lending in renewables, and we do continue to see this business as one of our core business going forward. And uh, also, we are one of the banks that have committed in uh, net zero footprint by 2050. And also, quite recently, we committed to the first milestone by 2030 to start building on a process. I mean, uh, 2050 is a very nice to have uh, as an aspiration, but it's a lot down the road. It's not something that we can see coming very easily, so we're starting to build milestones till we reach this uh, point. What we really see now is uh, we see a need for standardization of what each one of us refers to as green or sustainable. We think that uh, this is probably a regulator's task or a government task, mm -hmm. that we should uh, have some clear definitions between ourselves and build a clear path so that everyone can follow and everyone can meet these goals that we all aspire to. Thank you, Dimitris. Um, this is what we are also working on, <laughs> actually. Um, so our next speaker, Jan Ulko, who is waiting for us online. Thank you, Jan, for, for your time and uh, joining us uh, today. Um, so Jan is uh, representing TSKB Turkey. He is senior manager at FI and Investor Relations Department. Jan, over to you, please. Thank you, Nana. And ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to start by sending my warmest greetings from a sunny Istanbul afternoon. Let me briefly introduce TSKB first. TSKB is a privately owned development and investment bank which was founded in 1950 with the initiation of the World Bank Group. Our mission is to enhance sustainable economic development of Turkey by supporting the private sector's development. We have a long history with the development financial institutions and especially EVRD is a very close partner as well. We see sustainability as our core to our business. We have started to initiate the first environmental related loans at early 1990s. And moreover, developed an internal tool called ERET, which is environmental and social risk evaluation tool. We use it for every loan we extend. We measure not only the financial risk, but also the environmental and social risk of the projects we are involved in. This has been our main model for many years. And where, in 2021, we have also implemented climate risk evaluation tool to evaluate credit projects within the framework of physical and transition risk by considering climate-related risks in detail. As a next stage, we aim to integrate the risk score model outputs into our internal rating model as well. Let me also state that, as a carbon-neutral bank in, in our direct ambitions, our effort are and will be on the portfolio-based indirect impact, which is the main part and difficult to measure, monitor, and manage. At the end of 2021, we started to integrate financed emissions into the calculation and verification processes of our scope three emissions. Starting with the carbon intensive sectors, we included 8.4% of our portfolio in this process recently. One of the last year's milestones was our membership in the Net Zero Banking Alliance launched by UNAPFI. With the signature, we have committed to align our loan and investment portfolio with the zero emission targets by 2050. In the upcoming period, we will transparently share our roadmap, targets, and performance within the scope of our commitment with our stakeholders. We have also completed our application to Science-Based Targets Initiative for our scope one, two, three emissions, and our verification process is ongoing. 
As a supporter of the efforts to pri provide climate finance to Tur Turkey, we keep our strategy up to date with our dynamic business model to better understand the needs of the real sector in terms of climate change mitigation and adaptation and to maximize our contribution to the private sector. As a development and investment bank, thanks to our long-lasting relationship with DFIs and IFIs and also our technical capacity, we develop new funding teams in line with our country and customers' needs. Let me also remind that TSKB is the first ever institution to issue a green sustainable bond out of the wider CE MEA region and the first ever institution to issue sustainable tier two bond globally. These were done in 2016 and 17 respectively. We have implied ICMA standards for our sustainability finance frameworks, for our sustainable bond issuances, and we have now aligned our framework with the EU taxonomy to the extent it is possible. In addition to our current DFI and DCM sustainable funding tools, we have also realized green trade finance deals, which I will touch upon on the next round. As a conclusion, we can say that all these actions were taken to create a green finance portfolio for the bank, where it can be said that managing climate risk is a top priority for TSKB. And as explained, we have implemented a range of measures to manage these risks effectively. By integrating climate risk into our risk management framework, reviewing our lending portfolio, implementing risk mit mitigation measures, establishing a climate risk committee, and engaging with our stakeholders, we are showing utmost importance to green finance. And last but not the least, we are now focusing on new sustainable teams for our loans, such as circular economy in which products and materials are repaired, reused, and recycled. And this will be a core component of our strategy to achieve the transition to a low carbon economy in the near future. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Jan. And uh, now let's hear from Ismoil, um, who is um, head of FI unit at uh, Sanwat Kurilish Bank. Yeah. Thank you. So, hello. So, uh, banks, uh, banks involvement with green financing uh, started a long time ago, but it was, you know, very narrow definite. We were financing all energy efficiency transactions, but starting to, uh, from 2019, Bank decided to go, uh, you know, with, in a different direction and to increase the scope of transactions, which we call green. So, in, in order to uh, assist uh, and uh, transform this, bank started cooperation with IFC, and in 2020, bank opened its green uh, banking department, which now uh, involved in uh, finding, analyzing, and monitoring green transactions. Uh, and now, like uh, instead of previous energy, uh, just providing loans to energy efficiency transactions uh, by green uh, finance in our bank, we mean you know providing more and more uh, loans to uh, renewable energy, clean transportation, green buildings. So it's uh, more broader in scope at the moment. So uh, and uh, in 2020, the bank's green portfolio consists of only 47 million USD. But uh, just only like two, uh, two or three years has passed, and now 5% uh, of the bank's portfolio, uh, roughly like uh, 250 million USD, is, uh, belongs to green loans. So we have done uh, quite some job there. Uh, and at the moment, uh, as colleagues mentioned, we have uh, finalized our job with, uh, with the assistance of Raiffeisen Bank in uh, preparing our sustainability framework which uh, can be used to uh, attract and uh, uh, in, 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 you know, placing our first uh, ESG bonds. Uh, and uh, uh, we are at the moment working on uh, getting our ESG rating. This is kind of our next priority. So, um, and uh, uh, at the moment, bank has provided to all business segments uh, uh, a loan product, uh, starting from green mortgages to you know financing clean transportation. So, uh, uh, and, and the next target is to become the you know first green bank in in the republic. So, yeah. Good luck with getting the ESG rating. It's Thank an you. important milestone, of course. Um, Xenia. So Xenia is uh, representing our green financial systems. She is head of uh, Caucasus, Central Asia, and Turkey. 
please, Xenia, maybe you can brief us a little bit about our work, what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. Um, I think at every um, TFP event we are talking about EBRD, green strategy and our objectives, but today I actually want to look back at the last 12 months or six months from uh, the time we met in Istanbul um, or 12 months from uh, Marrakesh, Marrakesh meeting. Um, what have we achieved? And I'm saying we on purpose. It's not we EBRD, but it's uh, yourself and us. Because without active participation of confirming banks, issuing banks, partners, um, but also our fellow MDBs, we wouldn't have been uh, here today. So what have we done um, in, in um, 22? Uh, we have um, assessed and uh, confirmed 190 um, green trade transactions. Uh, worth 420 million euros um, and this is a fundamental achievement but we can do much more and I'm really calling everyone in the audience and those connected online to look into upscaling um, green trade business together. Uh, we have uh, included transactions um, involving uh, green materials, uh, process technology, certified products uh, renewable energy, um, different types of uh, technologies and machinery uh, that support low carbon transition. And um, not only that, Martina earlier mentioned about the importance of uh, capacity building and what we have done, we have over these past 12 months organized a number of dedicated green trade finance events in countries of operations. And Nana was actually the champion of, of, of this work, but also Olga, who, who had a very similar workshop uh, here in, in Uzbekistan most recently. And we brought together our partners from ICC, confirming banks, um, commercial banks from the regions, but also central banks and financial regulators who play a fundamental role in defining the rules, defining standards, facilitating uh, discussion in, in local markets, but also uh, giving this additional regulatory push to uh, green finance delivery through the commercial banks. And uh, we have conducted events in Armenia, Georgia, um, Uzbekistan, but also Turkey, and we are looking to do much more um, this year. So please, if you have demand interest for such activities in your countries, come forward, ask for support, we will be there to help you and uh, run, run those um, educational events. Um, Something else I wanted to mention is our engagement and partnership with fellow MDBs and Dimitri has mentioned we need to come to common standards and rules and what we have specifically been doing is trying to harmonize the way we assess green transactions. Uh, when we look at diff diff different certification standards um, um, and uh, technical criteria that we apply consistently among MDB community. Um, so this is uh, work in progress and we are also, of course, engaging with our partners from ICC and other organizations to come up with common um, consolidated uh, rule book for green trade. Um, and last but not least, a third element um, is a transformational change. We as MDB, we really look now into transforming financial institutions, helping them on the transition journey, um, and we have a number of instruments to support this change. So we are really looking at institutional transformation, touching all areas of activities of partner banks, not just individual products like uh, trade or um, lending lines. Um, we are trying to integrate climate considerations into three elements governance and strategy of financial institution, risk management, introducing climate risk management processes, but also uh, we look at setting right metrics and targets, as well as um, supporting public disclosures of, of non-financial um, indicators and, and parameters. And for that, we have set up um, a dedicated technical advisory facility um, and we invite partner banks to 
come forward, um, ask for support, and we will be there to help you on this transition journey. And I'm very pleased to say that um, Ismail is, is representing one of the banks that is also working with us, but we are all in it together. And um, as Martina just was, was explaining, the project that uh, two institutions are developing together is also looking at, at the same sort of um, aspect of systemic um, transformation over financial institutions, and we can do a lot more. As Ismail mentioned, the, the, uh, the speed of upscaling green finance is feasible. We just need to be more systemic and focused about it. Thank you. Um, now let's hear from our partners about their um, achievements in the green trade finance specifically and what kind of challenges they are facing and maybe there are some ideas how MDBs like EBRD for instance can step in in this process and the support. Um, let's start with our champion banks. Um, Dimitris Jan, I will start with you please. Uh, Dimitris, over to you and then uh, we can hear from Jan. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. It's um, last year, let's say, that we had one of the um, transactions that we are really proud of. It was a transaction in Algeria to export uh, for uh, wastewater treatment facilities to revitalize some landfill areas that we used to uh, in the country. But what we see now is that uh, we must have, uh, through EBRD, TFE, and through your assistance, around, I should say, 20 to 25 million of transactions last year. Although the number for the bank exceeds 100 million, what we see is that uh, the program is structured due to the tenure of uh, three years that has as a maximum. We cannot cover performance bonds, mm -hmm. and uh, Greece is a country that has a lot of experience and a lot of companies with experience in building renewable facilities abroad. So this is something that we have to find ways to do it ourselves without your support, and this is something that probably we should look into in the future. What, we, what I would like to point out, however, is that uh, we are still treating green trade finance as a boutique product. And that's something that should gradually start to stop with. I think it should uh, turn into a mainstream product and uh, find ways through capacity building, which is, of course, something that we mentioned, through incentives that we as banks and maybe also you as supporters of this uh, whole transaction mechanism could uh, provide, find ways to provoke our clients to do more green trade finance as opposed to doing more trade finance without separating from the... What we see is that there are a lot of green transactions that uh, go below the radar because no one has any interest in the rest of the market to point them out, to mm -hmm. see, look at what I'm doing, this is green, this is sustainable, this is something, there's no incentive, there's no, I don't know, no one has uh, built these capacities, uh, Xenia said at the beginning, it's something that we should focus on in the next uh, year or so to make green more mainstream and less of a boutique product. Uh, Dimitris, you are, you, you are seeing more demand now in longer tenors? On the performance bonds, yeah. Uh -huh. We see a lot of more demand on performance bonds. We can cover this ourselves, however, we cannot cover this through your, uh, your assistance due to the three-year uh, maximum mm -hmm. tenure that we offer. Okay, okay, good to know. Thank you. Uh, John, over to you, please. Thank you, Nana. It's hard to be on the screen and away from the audience, so uh, thank you. I mean, uh, for the question, I guess during the pandemic, uh, the whole FI team of TSKB was so bored and there was nothing else to do, so we came with an idea to develop a green trade finance instrument. We had an experience, of course, with our green sustainable boards already, which were designed to finance environmentally friendly projects that promoted sustainable de development. So the first tool we had managed to successfully realize was a KPI linked club loan where we had a, where we had five of our close FI institutions attended and this was done before the whole syndications were changed to sustainable linked loans in Turkey. After managing to obtain this sustainable linked loan, 
I guess the boredom of Panda Wings even increased. So we started to work on a green trade finance instrument with one of our partner banks located in European Union. And we have completed the deal as being the first ever green trade finance instrument extended by our partner bank uh, as well. Also, in addition to this one, we have realized one other with a global bank. It was their globally first green trade finance deal. And let me state that as TSKB, we are quite proud to be in the first of our partner FIs as well. After closing these two successful deals, we have started to work with EBRD trade finance program, where now I should thank the whole EBRD team for tapping us on the program on a relatively harsh environment these, those days. And also, if I am not mistaken, the deals we have realized underneath this program until this day is 100% green. Correct. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we do not only consider the goods under to be green for a green trade deal, but also try to add a KPI to the funding we obtain so that we achieve two goals at one deal. As an example, while financing a steel scrap deal, we are also giving a commitment for achieving an environmental goal as TSKB as well. This could be further improvement of our ESG score, however, which is now almost impossible because we are in the top notch already globally, or financing more green deals in a certain period of time and so on. As mentioned, we have seen EBRD on our side while realizing green, green trade deals. However, we would have wanted our other DFI friends to support these mechanisms through extending guarantees or, or even with direct lending or co-lending facilities. The main challenge here is that even though the lending is green, it is still affected by the macroeconomic risk approaches towards Turkey and therefore to support more green trade finance deals, the Turkish banks will need more DFI support in the near future as well. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Jan. Uh, moving on to our host country, yeah. Uzbekistan. Ismail, so, please. Yes, I just wanted to mention here that uh, also there are many challenges in front of us because we have just started our journey in this green banking. I just wanted to mention here that uh, one of the big challenges that we, at the moment we are facing is uh, comes from customers because, you know, being emerging country, uh, main priority for the client at the moment is, you know, to, to get its uh, equipment or if we talk about like investment project and to start the business or to expand its operations. Uh, so, but that, and in, in this, uh, uh, and they, they like main priorities to, you know, uh, to start the work, but they, they are not like uh, giving more, uh, focus on, on the green aspects of like making it more green their uh, business that, that's kind of one of the green uh, one of the challenges for for the bank because like when we approach our clients and uh, uh, you know propose them two alternatives one is like um, uh, just a loan for, for the equipment and as one is like a green loan for them when they purchase the, some you know uh, pro, pro equipments with green elements they mostly prefer to go with uh, the, the first option uh, and that's why that's why we wanted to mention here that one of the challenges to and, and, and we wanted to ask colleagues from like uh, MDBs like ADB BRD to organize uh, trainings for for the like businesses as well in the country because this this will, uh, uh, we suppose, that it, to increase the awareness among business people, so that they they will ch like go with mostly with green technologies. Because uh, well, uh, at the end of the day, like the main priority should be, you know, not only uh, thinking about bottom line, but also, you know, to have to have a sustainable business and, you know, uh, to to uh, you know care about the planet as well. So this is uh, the challenge. Yeah. Thank you. Martina, over to you, please. I would like to address this question by telling you what we have done in trade finance um, and then by also telling you what the, are the challenges that we faced. Um, we have done three main things in trade finance. Um, we have created a green trade finance offering. Um, we have created an ESG reporting. I can tell you 
at each point in time what my ESG portfolio is in numbers and also in uh, volume and why it is uh, green yeah, and how it is documented and who has approved it. And I've changed the culture of the people. Yeah, and I'm still in between. Yeah, I've not yet, uh, I'm not yet there where I want to be. And um, coming to the first point, the green uh, trade finance offering, I fully uh, um, uh, relate to you when you say um, we must stop looking at transactions only. Yeah, so we have a transactional um, approach as well. Yeah, this is where we uh, find a transaction to be green, which is mostly in the evident sectors. Yeah. Um, when it goes about energy efficiency, when it goes about uh, um, um, uh, um, a biomethan uh, production facility, um, these are the transactions, yeah, and you find them here and there, and then you classify uh, them as green. But what I find to be easier, and that what we have included into our offering, is not only the transactional approach, but also a facility approach by which we try to change the behavior of our clients in the long run. So what are we doing here? We agree with the client a frame, and uh, based on this frame, we agree upon KPIs that he has to fulfill. Mm -hmm. For instance, with respect to CO2 reduction, uh, or uh, investment into um, green innovation technologies. Yeah? And I personally find that this way of doing it, because you can do this even with a client that is not in the green sector, on the long run, you achieve a change in the behavior of the client. And first of all, it's easier yeah, to, obviously it's a lot of discussion with setting it up to find the right uh, KPIs. Um, and uh, obviously our colleagues from Sustainable Finance Department are very, very much in, uh, involved here. But it is a long-term approach to change the behavior. Um, and also here, if the client fulfills the KPIs, which have to be certified uh, by a third party, then we give him tiny um, benefit. Um, if he does not fulfill the KPIs, he has to pay something to the CE uh, charity fund of Herbert Stepich. Yeah? Okay. It's, it's a very, um, um, in my view, efficient way of how to change behavior in the long run. That's the first the product offering that we've created. And I have to say, we did not reinvent the wheel. We have taken what was there on the loan side and we have adapted it for trade finance. The second point is the reporting. Um, our board said we want to have 30% uh, ESG assets by 2025. This is a big ambition and challenge. And I, at Trade Finance, I had no clue what my ESG portfolio was because we have thousands of transactions. So how can you do that? Um, and here we have developed, first of all, the IT capacities to, um, to flag each transaction. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I'm with you, we, we only start with a certain amount to look into details, yeah? um, and uh, then also to have a process with the colleagues from Sustainable Finance Department that then they approve such transactions. Yeah? And here we face the challenge, as you have mentioned, that we have different standards. We have the EU taxonomy standards, um, we have the, 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 the green bond standards, for instance, and we have different standards across the, across the globe. Um, and, and here I have really to admit that we, we, we will be awarded uh, with uh, two uh, green uh, uh, trade finance transactions uh, uh, today by EBD. I'm spoiling a little bit. <laughs> um, but I have to tell you that my colleagues in trade finance, they have identified these transactions to be green. Then we have asked for information and sustainable finance department, due to lack of information, said it's EU. Um, um, eligible but not aligned. That's why we could not flag them as green. Mm -hmm. Then we received information from you. It's, uh, for you, it's green. Yeah? And we again did the research and went even deeper. Yeah. And it's a lot of work that has to be done. And then ultimately, yeah, it was, they were classified to be green. So this is a real challenge yeah, that we don't have uh, unified uh, standards. I know that ICC is, um, is working here also in a working group to um, to, uh, to create those standards, but I know that they also they are a little bit struggling. Yeah? And then this, this, the third point that we have done is, um, is to, to change the people. And what I want to achieve is that the topic of ESG becomes like compliance for my people. So I want that, this, uh, that ESG and the culture of ESG is being embraced by them and is being looked at at each transaction as if it was the case for compliance 10 years ago. And we have done that, that process, we have 
uh, entered this process by um, nominating compliance ambassadors. In each of the teams, I have two compliance ambassadors that, similar to me, started to learn the subject. Yeah? And they are the ones that are having co um, the conversations with sustainable finance department, and by that they are learning. Yeah? And they are the go-to persons for all the other people that are uh, working on the transactions, that are having suspicions yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, th this may, may be a green transaction, and um, uh, they are the ones that somehow are bringing this culture into the department. Um, how, how you and we can uh, jointly um, uh, even work better together, I think it's the educational topic that we are addressing with our ESG advisory team, and um, I think here we should collaborate even more with EBRD. As mentioned, we are trying also to, to, to change our clients by making them aware that sooner or later the non-green portfolio will be also from a regulatory perspective more expensive, and this will come as I sit here. And that's why we have started with this incentivization of the green portfolio already now and the disincentivization of all the other portfolio uh, that is not ESG compliant. And I think also this is something where I know that you, for certain transactions you're offering longer turners, but I think yes. this is also something um, that uh, we could jointly think of. And then I think if we speak about RBI, I have to say that Honestly, also what the EU did with the uh, 2050 agenda to become carbon neutral, this had an additional boost. So I think governmental talks uh, are really important uh, also in, in this region, and I know that uh, the, um, this region has other topics as well. Yeah? Uh, so it's difficult to think about sustainable uh, finance if you have to solve basic problems, let's mm -hmm. put it like that. But I think these governmental talks are also super important. Thank That's you. it in a nutshell. Yeah, I think it's very similar what we do. We, we, we basically go through each and every transaction and just try to identify maybe there is some green component. And the information that you didn't have on those transactions, it's because we just thought that maybe there is something. Then we went back to the clients, asked for information and assessed it based on that. So Xenia, over to you because Xenia's team is helping us in trade finance to you know achieve all these goals. Um, please, Ksenia. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I, I would like to highlight um, actually four fundamental elements that will uh, help us uh, to achieve our common goals. Uh, one is, um, and, and sorry to repeat myself and, and, and colleagues here, is education. Because without basic technical understanding and skill, we won't be able um, to deliver. Um, we have another challenge connected to education. We have to train uh, effectively an army of trade finance professionals, uh, bankers, but also clients, SME clients who will bring those transactions to the banks. Um, and um, the question is, okay, how, how we are going to do that? Um, from EBRD side, of course, we have technical advisory resources, but we have also developed um, a dedicated e-learning program, which is uh, called EBRD Green Finance Academy. It already has 10 modules. It's free of charge for partner banks to sign up to the program. Please, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, come speak to me or approach Nana. We will. Um, um, uh, provide access to this program. We have 10 modules, one of them is dedicated to green trade, but um, anyone can, can sign up and um, benefit from this program. In June this year, we will expand the program to include also climate corporate governance um, aspect um, uh, and, and transition planning aspect. Um, into the program, uh, please stay tuned and, and also get access to the program as soon as possible and just um, have a look. And um, we are also thinking of potentially developing a program for SME clients together with our um, SME finance and development colleagues. So maybe there will be also an additional module for your borrowers, for your clients. Um, second important element is technology. Um, as Martina said, those standards, they are so complex. But we need to be practical. We need to remain practical. It should be easily um, understood by, um, by the army of uh, trade finance professionals um, in the regions. 
And how do we do that? Of course, we have engineers who help us assess individual transactions, but we also have our green technology selector, which, uh, which is a, a de facto a, an online platform and a mobile app that includes hundreds and thousands of exporters and importers. Um, so any bank involved in trade finance can easily access the platform and use it for identification of um, green investments, but also for marketing, for engaging with those exporters and importers. Um, um, then we are also looking into expanding functionality of this tool uh, at the moment and having a dialogue and discussions with confirming banks to see how we can make it um, more usable and easily uh, you know, digestible by the market. Uh, so if you have any ideas how we can improve the system, please come talk to us and we will listen and we will implement those changes that, that are needed. Um, uh, and of course, uh, talking about technology, I would also like to invite uh, fintech partners uh, to, to, to come with innovative solutions, to, to, to see what, ca what else can we do um, to make um, life easier for all of us. Um, third element is mix of finance. Um, and mix of finance, uh, not, it's not only about the money, it's about partnerships um, that, again, Martina um, has, has shared with us, but also we had uh, really interesting experiences from um, uh, Pereus Bank. Um, EBRD is not the only partner for you to, 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 to transform your institution. We call for everyone to, to, to speak to their partners, to confirming banks, um, to, to other institutions in the market um, and ask for help. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. We can look at experiences of best practices and best in the market institutions who have already done it once. Um, and uh, yes, Chan is uh, on the screen, but TSKB in Turkey was a champion of, of, of um, green transformation and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can look at those experiences um, and, and adopt some of, of good elements that, that work for your institutions. And last but not least, it's about standards. Um, Yes, many of EBRD countries of operations are outside of the European Union. Um, and we know uh, there is a tide of sustainable finance regulation coming from the EU and influencing, first of all, EU markets. However, the first movers are always multinationals and big banking groups. They will drive this change through the supply chains. And those supply chains, they will touch every small SME in our countries of operations, which means it's our role, role of EBRD, but also all partner banks here in the audience to help those SMEs to adopt, to get ready for the change. And uh, we are clearly here to help. And we, we will be, you know, um, um, helping um, transforming not only financial institutions, but also real economy. Um, and I think um, just uh, as a final word, um, the sustainable uh, finance train has almost mo moved on and, and left the station. So if you want to get on, I think it's time. <laughs> Definitely. I think we are right on time. Thank you, Xenia, so much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you can enjoy the coffee break now and we will be back in 15 minutes, please. Thank you.
participants to network with each other and if some of our, co our colleagues and friends are still at coffee, it's also a good sign. It's a good sign that the purpose of our conference meets its targets so that people get together, meet each other and establish new friendships and contacts and, uh, and exchange business cards. On this panel today, I, I decided to invite representatives of uh, associations uh, because uh, in our, under our program, of course, we work with banks. Uh, we facilitate trade through banks and for banks we only lend to importers and exporters. Uh, but we are a comparatively small team based in London and uh, we can only reach out uh, to our partner banks and uh, to importers and exporters if we cooperate with associations. And associations we play an important role because uh, they have members they have members in our countries of operation and they support our members uh, through education, through networking opportunities, through rules and uh, for this reason we always decided to work closely together with all uh, associations who are interested in uh, finding new members and supporting our members in all our countries. And uh, uh, perhaps uh, on this panel I'm joined uh, by uh, four gentlemen uh, including also my colleague uh, from our legal transition team. Um, my colleague from the legal transition team, uh, he is, his name is Michael, Michael Nussbaumer and um, he, is director of, and he is director of legal transition in EBRD. Uh, and uh, the legal transition team plays an important role uh, because it, it uh, sets the frame, it um, has a constant policy dialogue with governments and regulators and uh, for this reason I'm also happy that uh, on this panel we, do not, we have not only associations but also colleagues who can explain to us uh, how for EBRD does a very important gr groundwork also in helping our countries of operation to adjust legislation to the needs of trade finance. But to start with perhaps my first question and to, 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 to the only lady on my panel and this is Leo, uh, she's director of the Trade Finance Week of the International Chamber of Commerce in Austria and uh, perhaps my first question to Leo, uh, how do you support uh, for development of trade and trade finance and how do you and, and your association supports for development and trade finance in our countries of operation? Thank you, Rudolf. Um, thank you for inviting us and as Rudolf already said, so I'm representing ICC Austria. Um, that means we are a national committee of the worldwide network of the International Chamber of Commerce. We have another network member sitting here. Hi, Vin. Lovely to see you. Um, so what we do, um, in parts we're doing that with ICC Austria and a lot of you probably know that already with the Trade Finance Week. That's our annual conference, our platform where we're trying to bring together trade finance operators, so bank guarantee experts and letters of credit specialists um, from around the globe. We're currently hoping for a very good turnout, looks very good. So the next one is uh, from 12th to 16th in uh, June in Vienna. We're finally back in Vienna. If you haven't signed up, please remember there's a website, it's called tradefinanceweek.org. So registration is still open. Um, and we are hoping for 150, 160 participants and already 30, 35 countries are attending. And with that, I just had a look today, Rudolf. So from your countries of operation, um, we welcome Armenia and we also will welcome Albania. Kosovo is coming. Um, of course, um, Uzbekistan, members from Uzbekistan are coming, Kazakhstan will be coming, so I'm very excited and I hope to see a lot of you from the room. So that is what we're doing with the National Committee um, side, but I'm also a member of the Banking Commission representing the International Chamber of Commerce. And some of you may have felt a little neglected or the region may have felt a little neglected by us um, for a very long time. This is about to change because I am super excited that I can let you in on a secret. Um, there's going to be an ICC Uzbekistan and it will be established within this year. Um, they're very close um, to getting this done and we're very, very happy for that. So Uzbekistan is getting their own national committee um, and we would love to welcome you to the ICC family. And with that, the important thing is that 
the Uzbek voice is heard within the international banking community. You have your own point of view, you have the things that are particularly difficult in your country, and we want to hear what that is about, and we want to help. So please hit me up. I brought a zillion business cards. If you're interested in what the ICC is doing, if you have a particular question, we see each other as connectors. Um, just, you know, approach me um, and I'll hand you out one. And if you have a specific question that I can't answer, I'm sure I know somebody who can. Yeah, thank you very much for this short survey. Uh, I have attended for ICC Trade Finance Week several times. And uh, I think it's the most useful event if you want to event one, one, if you want to attend one, year, one, one event every year, just go to the Vienna Trade Finance Week, uh, because this is really uh, a knowledge and such a collection of knowledge and expertise in one week uh, with presentations, and uh, it's really specialized on documentary credits on guarantees. Uh, but uh, Leo is now planning to extend her support not only to documentary credits but also to receivables financing, factoring, and supply chain finance. Uh, so, if you're a trade finance expert, this is definitely a good recommendation to go. It will take place in Vienna on the 12th to 16th of June. Uh, Vincent, you play a very important role in ICC because you are not only very active in the Dubai Chamber of Commerce, uh, but you also have been uh, training uh, our partner banks in documentary credits. Uh, well, for already since the start of a trade facilitation yeah, program. About, tw about 20 years now. So, how, how, see you, how see, do you see the role of associations and of your association in, in the development of trade finance? Well, uh, it's great to see everyone. I'm, uh, some of you I haven't seen for maybe four or five years, but I just want to say you all look better than the last time I saw you. <laughs> so, I don't know what your trick is, but I really, I, really want, want to, I really want to learn it. But regarding ICC UAE, where I'm working right now, we do the best we can to facilitate trade with EBRD countries of operation. So just a few examples. Uh, last December, with Michael Bickers of BCR, who is here somewhere, we, uh, we hosted, ICC UAE hosted the MENA Supply Chain Finance Forum. And we had participants from Morocco, uh, Jordan, Lebanon, and also from Egypt. And we had one person from Kazakhstan. So then fast forward then uh, in, uh, in March of this year, uh, we had the Global Trade Facilitation Summit in UAE, uh, in Dubai. And uh, we had participation from many of your countries of operation. And again, a little bit like Trade Finance Week, it's a week-long event. It starts on a Monday with networking and setting up meetings for participants. And then on the Tuesday, we have, uh, uh, we have a trade law and compliance event. And then on the evening, there's a reception. And then on the Wednesday, there's day one of the conference. And you were one of the key speakers, uh, Rudolph. And then on day two is the second day of the conference. And then we have a gala dinner. And then we send everyone to the Museum of the Future. And all of this costs for participants from EBRD's countries of operation and other emerging markets $100. And the reason it costs $100 is because ICC UAE, but mostly our government and our ruler, really takes facilitating trade and getting people together really, really, really seriously. So our next event is on the 29th of April next year. You're all welcome, but it'll cost you $100. But it'll be the best $100 you'll ever spend in your life. You believe me? Oh, good. Someone believes me. So then just for a moment, other things. Um, last month, actually, we were in Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan with EBRD. We did a training session. And in fact, uh, we, this was the first event ICC Kyrgyzstan ever, ever had. And that was last month. And only next month, then, we're going to where are we going next month? Okay, uh, I know, uh, I, I'm missing out, where am I going? Oh, we're going to Armenia. And actually Armenia, the new, the new chair of the banking commission in Armenia is here, and actually it's a lady, uh, Inessa Ambrakan, she is here actually today. That will be next month, that's June, and then in July we go to Baku in Azerbaijan with EBRD for a training, and uh, that will be July. Then in August we're going to Mongolia, Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, so I'll wow. see you in Mongolia, and that's in August. And then in September, we're going with EBRD again and ICC, we're going to Lebanon, and uh, we're going to Jordan, and that's uh, uh, September and October. I can only think about six months, then I forget everything. And then in, in uh, October, we're in Cairo, and we are in uh, Istanbul in Turkey. So that gives you a snapshot of what we're doing, but don't forget, 29 April next year, you're, you're all, all invited. That's about it.
Peter, you are representing the largest association for factoring and supply chain finance worldwide. Uh, you have a big network already. You have managed to significantly grow, grow the number of members. How do you do it and how do you see the development in our countries of operation? Uh, well, thank you, Rudolph. And uh, first of all, it's great to be here. I, 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 this is my first time uh, to this part of the world, to be frank. Um, and uh, it's a, a dream of mine to come here. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a history buff. I'm a history uh, major in college. And yeah, it's just uh, such a special, special place. So I'm actually looking forward to my tour <laughs> whenever it is this, this week. Yes, uh, well, listen, uh, the answer to the, your question is easy. 90% of, of global trade is now on open account which means 90% of, of the economies of the world, companies of the world, have receivables on their balance sheets sitting there, sitting there uh, really doing nothing. And um, there's another statistic. I think it was from Bain uh, did a study. They said that 40% of all assets on, a, on the balance sheet of a company are receivables. And so, yeah, you, in the, in the uh, uh, developed countries uh, where receivable finance has been, you know, well, well underway for, for decades, uh, in some places, uh, centuries, um, yeah, it's, it's a common product. It's a common product. It's a household product. But in most emerging countries, it's brand new. And this region is an example of that, a virgin territory, uh, as we say. So... Um, how do we grow? We grow because the demand for people uh, needing to learn about how to take a receivable off the balance sheet of a supplier of an SME, how do they control the risk of that receivable, fund it, how do they collect the proceeds of that receivable, how do they control the risk of debtor financing, how do they control the risk of dilution, uh, political risk, everything relating to that asset. And that's what FCI really is all about and what we we teach. I like to say, uh, Aishin Satintas here is the uh, director of uh, our, our academy, uh, FCI Academy, and I always joke, and Spiros as well works with, uh, um, with Aishin, I always joke and say, you know, the academy is 50 years of mistakes. It's built on 50 plus years of mistakes, mistakes that have occurred with our members and they've been kind enough to tell us what went wrong. And so, you know, we, we like to say we like to help our members uh, you know, understand how to maneuver in this you know, kind of treacherous, challenging world. Um, the last thing I'll just say is, uh, you know, we couldn't do this without the support of EBRD. Uh, e EBRD really, you can put them on the pedestal. And then I'm not, you know, blowing smoke up the, of my, my friend here, Rudolph, but it's true. Um, because I can tell you, we have a partners all around the world and there's no relationship like the EBRD relationship. They have uh, taken from our academy uh, and, and basically uh, uh, allowed their members to take uh, courses from the FCI Academy for their members for free. Uh, and they've, they have now over 400 courses that have been distributed. And now they've committed to doing a, another 800 courses uh, in fundamentals, introduction, so for beginners, and uh, supply chain finance. So these are three courses, for example, that they're going to uh, take and, and hopefully, uh, and, and, and that, that is something that you can do at your home. It's something you can do in your office. You can learn about all the mechanics of, of receivables finance uh, through the academy. So uh, that's just one example. I can go on and on. For the lack of time, I won't. Yes, no, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Rudolph. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, uh, we are really interested in, in growing this business because we see that not all trade finance transactions can be financed through, local, through the letters of credit and guarantees. More and more trade is being financed on open account, uh, or, or, so, or, or agreed on open account, but still, somebody still has to finance this business. Uh, so there is a huge potential to grow, and uh, we, in the next uh, years we will concentrating on supporting our partner banks also in the development of, low, of domestic and international factoring and supply chain finance business. Uh, Jean, you are representing uh, an association which uh, uh, covers all types of trade finance, uh, from pre-export finance up to receivables finance, so it's called the International Trade and uh, Forfeiting Association. Also, your association has been growing considerably in the last years. 
Yeah. Uh, how have you managed to do it and how do you see the potential <coughs> and how can you support our partner banks in the development of your trade finance business? So, um, wow, that's loud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, uh, my, my family always say I'm very loud, but not this loud. Um, so thank you, Riddle. Uh, so, um, so Peter is a historian. You're the pink lady. <laughs> and of course, you're always the funniest guy on stage, Vinny. Thank so you. So I'll be the poet because my Samarkand connection, and one of the reasons it was always on my bucket list, my dream to come here is a wonderful poem by James Flecker called The Golden Voyage to Samarkand, which, uh, uh, is, which begins, uh, we are we, we poets of the proud old lineage who sing to win your hearts. We know not why. What shall we tell you? Tales, wonderful tales. And I think this is it's more than tales here, of course. It's about facts. Now, getting back to the moving away from the poetic bit, and by the way, there's another line in that poem, which is the motto of the SAS, in case you're interested. We are pilgrims, master, and we'll always go a bit further. And maybe actually that is a more appropriate slogan for it, because from our foundation around 20 years ago, um, when we were only about a dozen members in Switzerland, we've moved to around about 300 members globally in over 50 countries. And we do cover, as you, as you say, the, the whole range of trade finance. And one of the things that I was very struck by um, earlier on listening to, 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 to the great panels we had is how much even in what five years ago we might have called the emerging markets is here, that actually everybody is extremely closely related and the needs um, and the, 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 the needs and the partnerships that everybody uh, has to have to be to run a successful trade finance business are now really truly global. Um, so some of the things that were mentioned earlier on, which uh, ITFA has been active in, supply chain finance, um, that's an area where we see what was a technique developed for very um, uh, 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 sort of uh, investment grade corporates, um, big, big companies, is now actually being um, applied to smaller corporates. And uh, certainly in relation to some of the EBRD countries of operations, we've had for two years now, had a very successful supply chain finance summit in Tallinn, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the Baltics. Um, so um, that's one area where I think we've sort of interacted a lot more uh, with, your, uh, with, your, uh, with your membership. But I see Nelly there in the audience from Converse Bank, who was a panelist last year at, one, one of our, uh, at, our annual, uh, at our annual meeting, talking about how supply chains are changing. And that was something else that was mentioned earlier on. Yeah because of the war in Ukraine, um, but because of global pressures, um, we're needing to bring, we're needing to redefine how supply chains work within Europe, most obviously in relation to energy, but also in relation to actually to a lot of other, um, a lot of other areas of trade, of, ma of manufacturing. Of course, we, there, are, there are tensions of China that everybody hopes we'll be able to avert, but um, people are putting in place their contingency plans. Um, so that's an area where you know, it has been very active in. On Friday, we've got here, thanks to your invitation, we've got a, um, just the day after uh, Peter's, uh, we've got a whole session on supply chain, but also about reinventing traditional trade. So looking at letters of credit and how they can be digitized. That's the other big area where it has been extremely active, uh, both on the lobbying front. So uh, there is an important new law. My, my day job is as a lawyer, so. I like this stuff, but all you need to know is there's an important new law that will come into effect in the UK uh, in the middle of the summer, and that will uh, allow a whole range of documents to be legally valid when they're in digital form. Now, that doesn't sound that great, and in a way, that's just the starting point. What's important is actually that you can commercialize this, you can, make, you can, you can actually use this to either grow your business or make your business more efficient. And that's something we'll be talking about as well because one of our mottos or our ethos within it for is that, you know, we talk the talk, but also we walk the walk. And it's all about finding those implementable solutions. So especially in relation to digitization, I've had a couple of initiatives which have been actually at the, at the, the core of a lot of legal change. Um, I have two things in digitization, DNI, digital negotiable instruments, which includes bills of lading, but also financial instruments, and then distribution of those through something we call 
the TFDI, the Trade Finance Digital and uh, di uh, Trade Finance Distribution Initiative. And I think to get back to this region and your members, I think all of that is very relevant. Um, one of the uh, a big event that we had a couple of months ago, Trade and Investment Forum, also with with Michael, I think I see him there, there he is. A um, uh, very successful event where we invited not just the banks, but also the non-bank investors, hedge funds, sovereign wealth offices, uh, family offices, sovereign wealth, uh, 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 and so on, um, uh, to, to introduce them to trade finance. And it's that liquidity that we need, they're hungry for assets. This area and your membership, uh, the countries of your members, are, are a great area for sourcing really good quality um, trade assets. So a lot of what we do seems to apply only to the very big Western banks, but I think increasingly um, it's, uh, it's extremely relevant and useful and profitable. And if you come on Thursday, we'll show you some of the ways in which we think that might work. Thank, Thank you, you. I just noticed that, uh, that two of our representatives from associations are lawyers, which shows how important <laughs> law is in trade finance because we we all, we all work with rules and with contract conditions and the trade finance needs not only bankers, it needs also lawyers and uh, for this reason I invited also Michelle today uh, to join us to this panel because uh, Michelle has a team which has been very helpful in uh, helping our countries to adjust for legislation and to improve legislation to make it more friendly for users of uh, trade finance and, and supply chain finance solution. So Michelle, give us a bit of a picture of what you are doing and what you have achieved so far in our countries. Okay, uh, thank you Rudolf and uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to see you all and hello to those who are watching online. So I'm here to tell you about a very special initiative of the EBRD, which is called the Legal Transition Program. The EBRD Legal Transition Program is the bank's initiative to help its countries of operations upgrade their legislation for investment and for business. So the philosophy is very simple. Good laws make good economies. So we believe that by working on improving legal frameworks, we, we help boost investment and boost uh, economic activity. And in that program, we work on a number of topics and one of them is access to finance, which includes precisely factoring matters and digital trade. So the program is a combination of policy dialogue, assessments and technical cooperation with governments. And we work closely with the, our banking colleagues you know, in the trade facilitation program, Rudolf and, and his team, uh, to, to define our priorities. And one thing we did um, was to conduct a, a factoring survey. It is an assessment of legislation in our countries of operations to see where there are gaps, you know, what needs to be improved. Um, and on the basis of that survey, we can then engage in, in policy dialogue with authorities. Um, and sometimes this dialogue can lead to requests for assistance by EBRD. And in that case, we have access to donor funding to hire local consultants to bring local knowledge, you know, languages, etc. So um, we have completed projects on factoring law in Kosovo. Montenegro and Croatia, so upgraded the legislation in, in those three countries. We have ongoing initiatives in North Macedonia, Georgia, Jordan, Ukraine, Uzbekistan, and West Bank and Gaza. So still results to come in, in these countries, but uh, to make a long story short, we, we believe that the EBRD is helping create the necessary environment for factoring transactions to, to bloom in, in these countries. Thank you. So thank you very much uh, for your short survey. Uh, we have still a couple of minutes left. So uh, one more question from my side. Yes, so and I would ask each of the panelists so for an answer of two minutes uh, maximum. And uh, my question would be, in which countries of EBRD's operation do you see the biggest potential for the development of uh, trade finance and factoring and receivables financing. And perhaps to start with Peter, in which Ooh. countries do you <coughs> see for, for the biggest growth for your industry? 
Well, I mean, right here, uh, I, we're starting from pretty much scratch. So, uh, uh, and you know, I was talking to my colleague here from Arm Swiss Bank. He was telling me how challenging the environment is with the transitions happening uh, in in their in Armenia, for example, today. The switch from trade with Russia, for example, and and now new markets, and it's 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 a, it's an opportunity, but it's a challenge. And so, you know, and. and this man here is a, he's an expert in factoring. And I said to him, please go be our, 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 our apostle, go to the, go to the other banks, let them know what you're doing. Um, you, you cited them as a great example of a, of a, of a, you know, a product, uh, this international factoring with your standby, with your guarantee. Um, I think it's phenomenal, the innovation. So, I think anything's possible, but I would say this region, uh, certainly uh, the countries of, of Northern Africa, uh, they're growing very, very fast. Egypt is going to be, I think, one of the top largest markets uh, in, in the world uh, in, in the future. They, they've gotten everything right um, in terms of their laws, in terms of their regulations, uh, receivables registry. Um, and uh, yeah, I would say as well, um, you know, uh, some of the, well, certainly the Central East Europe countries, I mean, they're all doing extremely, this region from Poland, and I know uh, my colleague over there, <laughs> Dorota, is, is here from, from Poland. You know, from Poland all the way down, they are the fastest growing countries in the world in receivables finance, exclamation point. There is no region growing faster. Uh, 20, 30, 40% is the norm for the last decade, uh, and it continues. Um, I will, I'm going to report tomorrow the global uh, factoring statistics on a very preliminary basis, but um, uh, you know that number is around 19 uh, percent. So, uh, but this region, so your region is such a, it's a it's a cornerstone for the industry, and uh, so again, uh, so much opportunity here, Good. Rudolph. Thank you very thank much. You. Vincent, you have had the luxury to travel to all our countries, yes? Yes. Uh, nobody knows our countries and for development of trade finance and documentary credits in our countries as well as you do. Yeah. Uh, in which countries do you see the biggest potential for growth for documentary credits and guarantees? Well, uh, in, in terms of traditional trade, such as letters of credit and confirmations, um, globally letters of credit, as you mentioned, Rudolf, are actually in decline. But there's a fact that a lot of people aren't aware of, and that is that the standby volumes are going up incredibly fast. So outstanding in the world right now, uh, the standby letters of credit now exceeds commercial letters of credit. And this is a transition in the last just few years, which is quite, quite interesting. So in terms of supply chain finance, you can take the risk on the debtor, but there are also programs where there will be a standby LC covering the risk, a little bit like what EBRD does, but actually on the, uh, on the commercial side. But really, uh, in my own opinion, I, you, you've seen me, I'm around for a long, 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 long time. Um, I feel the world has never been as uncertain as it is now, okay? Uh, I feel the geopolitical risks, and the risks are just huge, okay? I feel the uncertainty is huge. What's happening in the U.S. regarding interest rates, what's happening in the U.S. government at the moment, the conflict, or the tension with China. So all of these things tell you there's increased risk. And the increased risk means you should cover the risk. And when you're talking about transactions going from different jurisdictions to the other, it should be pointing towards an increase in commercial letters of credit and confirmation of letters of credit. But it hasn't arrived yet. But what we have seen is an increase in the use of standby LCs. And of course, as Peter said, supply chain finance. And I would be in agreement. I would say, apart from Central Asia, I would say, uh, you know, Morocco, uh, uh, Middle East, North Africa, Morocco, Tunisia, uh, Jordan, but particularly, yes, Egypt. Egypt, I think the potential, the potential is huge, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jean, well, where do you see the biggest growth potential? In which countries of EBRD's operation do you see the biggest growth potential for your association, but also for your members? Yeah, I, I think probably I, I would take, you know, probably Vincent's uh, uh, principal area of operations, which is, uh, which is actually the Gulf and the, the Middle East. And actually what we see, especially from a NIPFA perspective, is um, a huge growth. Because these are, this is a trade hub uh, region, a huge growth in, and, and there's a lot of liquidity in the banks, there's a, a huge growth in, uh, and also one might, I'll add another country into the mix. I know it's not part of your area of operations, but Saudi Arabia, a country that is rapidly changing. It's digitizing, of course, we all know there's a lot of liquidity and wealth there. 
there's been a few political slip-ups over the last couple of years. And they, they haven't gone as fast as they wanted to. It is now absolutely motoring. And, of course, uh, it's, it's, it's got the potential... It's funny when you look at, you know, Dubai and what happened and everyone looking to Dubai, then the focus moved a little bit towards Abu Dhabi. Now the focus is very much on, on, on Saudi Arabia because of the, the potential and the promise and the liquidity that, 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 that is there. So for us, in it, for getting back a little bit to our roots in supply chain finance in the broadest sense, receivables and payables finance, that's where we see uh, the biggest growth. And um, as with a lot of nations or countries that are... Um, reinventing or inventing themselves uh, and putting themselves, inserting themselves into the trade, the world, the global trade finance ecosystem, they have the opportunity, as do many of the countries in this region, to actually go for the best technology. And that's what certainly what we're seeing. Uh, enormous take up uh, in interest in reforming the law, um, but also in, in, in actually rolling out solutions uh, yeah, that can be you, used. Sean. Thank you, Sean. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Leo, uh, you are always, uh, you are, your, your numbers of your participants in for Trade Finance Week are growing now after COVID. Uh, in which countries have you seen the biggest growth of uh, participants in your Trade Finance uh, Week? Well, um, for this year, it's um, quite interesting. Um, we have a lot of people from Egypt coming, and I'm sure that has something to do with our constant uh, working together um, with uh, your trade facilitation program. And uh, Rudolf, may I say this? huge props to your team of putting the show together. Um, I know how hard it is and I can feel uh, for them. Um, in terms of a wider uh, perspective, um, when we talk, of course, as an ICC National Committee Austria, I cannot talk about global growth, but I can talk about global growth uh, from an ICC um, general perspective. And there we see um, our biggest regions, of course, Central Asia, finally on the map, with the attention from ICC, which is a huge step forward, much needed, and Wynne and I have been in various initiatives over the years to make that actually happening, and it's good to see that. Um, and then I think and I believe we have to look at Africa. This is going to be our next okay. um, step you, of yeah. inclusion. Uh, Michelle? Uh, perhaps an unexpected question, but I'm sure you can answer it, yes. Uh, in which countries do you think there is the biggest need for support by your team? Um, okay, uh, I think one way to look at this is to consider the factoring survey we have conducted and, and are looking where the biggest gaps are in the legal frameworks. And uh, if we do that, uh, I think I'm going to agree with the other panelists. I think the, the priorities would be in North Africa, what we call the SEMED region in, in EBRD jargon, and Central Asia. And I know that we have ongoing projects in uh, Jordan, uh, in uh, West Bank, and uh, in Uzbekistan. Uh, but of course, you know, we, we don't want to look only at uh, the, the legislation. We also like to combine these priorities with the EBRD investment priorities. And when, once we, we have compared notes with, with your team, uh, we, we came up with that list of priority countries, uh, Armenia, Kyrgyz Republic, Georgia, Greece, Romania, Egypt, Morocco, Turkey, Ukraine, Uzbekistan. These are the countries where we think we should prioritize our, our actions. So thank you very much uh, to all my panelists. I think it's encouraging to see uh, that all of them see a need for the EBRD, but also for your associations to become more active here in Central Asia, but also in the Mediterranean countries, in EBRD's countries of operation. So it's encouraging to see that we share views. Uh, we all work together. And uh, with uh, combined efforts, I think we will make good progress in all types of trade finance. So thank you very much for your commitment to EBRD's countries of operation, for your participation. And uh, now it's the time uh, to uh, to start thinking about our long-awaited award ceremony. So, thank you very much, and uh, I hand over to my colleagues who will now organize our EBRD's award ceremony. <laughs> Rudolf, actually, we have a refreshments first. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you can enjoy refreshments and uh, we will start the award ceremony at uh, 4.40 sharp. Thank you.
banks in our region and to honor their dedication and hard work. In case some of you don't know, each year we choose most active issuing banks on the number of transactions that were booked with us in the previous year. Welcome also to the award winners and partners who were unable to join us today. I'm sure they are watching us live and we look forward to celebrating with you all at our forum in Vienna in October. And now please welcome again Francis Malish and Dr. Rudolf Futz back to the stage and uh, we have a little bit of change. <laughs> so this year we changed the uh, format of the award ceremony a little bit and we tried to bring as much team members as possible. Of course, not everyone could come here, but we could still steal some of the uh, team members from their daily operations. So please welcome first uh, pair. Uh, Charlie and Gulshat, they will kick start the ceremony. Thank you, Nana. Our first award of the day goes to the most active issuing bank in Albania. We are pleased to announce that the winner is OTP Bank Albania. Congratulations. Congratulations. OTP Bank could not be here today, so we would like to invite Matteo Colangeli, Regional Head of the Western Balkans, to accept this award on their behalf. Matteo? Please. Ah. Welcome, Matteo. A round of applause, please. In their own words, OTP Bank Albania explore, discover, welcome, develop, and support the best side of everyone. Now we go to Armenia, where the most active issuing bank for 2022 is Arm Swiss Bank. Please welcome them to the stage. Arm Swiss Bank's vision is to be the leading bank, uh, investment and corporate bank in the Republic of Armenia. And we're thrilled to congratulate them on their fifth consecutive win. What an amazing achievement for Arms Swiss Bank. Moving on to Azerbaijan, where it is our pleasure to present the award for the most active issuing bank of 2022 to Bank Respublica. Please welcome Bank Respublica to the stage. Bank of Republic's motto is Cesar Faidali, which is translated as beneficial to you. Well done. Now we go to Bulgaria. Congratulations to United Bulgarian Bank for winning the most active issuing bank in 2022 for the second year running. UBB did not join us today, so please welcome to the stage the Managing Director for Central and Southeastern Europe, Charlotte Rue, to accept the award on their behalf. UBB, being client-centric, successfully uses the full potential of being a member of a larger group to meet the needs of all of its clients. The next winning bank is from Egypt. The award for most active issuing bank in Egypt in 2022 goes to Qatar National Bank Alakhli. Well Come done. On. As they were un unable to travel to Samarkand to accept this award, we would like to welcome Rania Al Mashat, Minister of International Cooperation, Arab Republic of Egypt, on stage to accept the award on their behalf. This bank aims to be the first choice bank in Egypt. We now go to Georgia, where we are pleased to announce that the most active issuing bank for 2022, the sixth year running, is TBC Bank. 
Congratulations to TBC Bank for their outstanding achievement. TBC Bank promises to make people's lives easier. Let's now travel to Greece. And now let's, let's, let's travel to Greece, where the most active issuing bank in 2022 goes to Piraeus Bank. bank. Congratulations. Piraeus Bank's mantra is trust and trust and entrusted. Well done. We move on to Jordan, where the winner of the most active issuing bank in 2022 is Bank Al Etihad. Well done. We would like to invite Philippe Tervaux, regional head of Eastern Mediterranean, on stage to accept the award on their behalf. Bank Al Etihad describes itself as courageous by nature. From the Middle East, we go to Central Asia. In Kazakhstan, the most active issuing bank in 2022 for the fifth year running is Bank Center Credit. Please welcome EBRD's head of Kazakhstan resident office, Hussein Oshan, to accept the award on BC Series. Congratulations, Hussein. BCC's mission statement is integrity, expertise, goodness, and friendliness. Well done, Bank Center Credit. And with that, we now hand over to our colleagues, Irina and Shopbrook, to present the next awards. Thank you. Thank you, Bishat and Charlie. My name is Irina. And my name is Shopbrook. And it is our pleasure to announce the next most active issuing banks in TFP. First, we go to Kosovo. The award for most active issuing bank in Kosovo in 2022 goes to NLB Banka. Congratulations. At the heart of this bank lies a vision of deep commitment to addressing the financial needs of their clients and making a positive impact on the quality of life in their country. Their mission reflects their determination to work collaboratively and develop their vision for current and future generations. Well done. Returning to Central Asia, our next award for the most active issuing bank in Kyrgyz Republic in 2022 goes to Optima Bank. Congratulations. Being the same age as independent Kyrgyzstan, last year Optima Bank celebrated 30th anniversary, 30th years of reliability and success. Well done to Optima Bank. Next up, we go to Lebanon. The most active issuing bank in Lebanon in 2022 is Bangaudi. Bangaudi could not be here today, so please welcome to the stage Khalil Bin Gizli, head of Lebanon, who will accept the award on the winner's behalf. Since the onset of the ongoing political, social and economic crisis that Lebanon has been experiencing since October 2019, Bank Audi's aim has always been to continue to support the Lebanese economy in all its pillars and contribute to the growth and potential recovery from the crisis. In Moldova, the award for most tax issuing bank in 2022 goes to OTP Bank. Congratulations. Congratulations. Collecting the award on behalf of OTP Bank is EBRD Angela Sachs, head of Moldova. OTP's bank's objective is to support the sustainable development of society, preserve cultural heritage, and increase financial literacy. From Moldova, we go to Mongolia. 
the most active issuing bank in Mongolia in 2022 is Ham Bank. Well, well done. Han Bank is the largest commercial bank operating in Mongolia. The bank offers different types of trade finance products to its customers and help them to optimize their cash flow and mitigate trade-related risks, growing together. Now, time to travel to Montenegro, where the most active issuing bank in 2022 is Hipotecarna Banka. Please welcome them to the stage. Congratulations. Hipotecarna Banka is the bank that is dedicated to the future. Well done. We now go to last year host country, Morocco, where the, for the seventh consecutive year, our most active partner bank is Bank of Africa, BMC Group. Congratulations. Congratulations. They could not be here today, so please welcome Antoine Seldeschuk, the party's head of Morocco on stage, to collect this award. Thank you, Antoine. Bank of Africa was recently nominated in March this year as Best Bank in Africa by Global Finance Magazine. From here, we take you to North Macedonia, where we have a tie. Both winners could not be here, so we have the pleasure of asking Matteo Calangeli, Regional Head of Western Balkans, back to the stage to collect both awards on their behalf. In alphabetical order, the first award for the most active issuing bank in North Macedonia in 2022 goes to Comercialna Banca, one of the leading banks in the Republic of North Macedonia, which is in its 67 years of existence has created an image of bank with tradition, confidence, safety, innovation and strong local and international reputation. Congratulations. The second award for the most active issuing bank in North Macedonia goes to NLB Banca, which is among the leading financial institutions with a constant upward trend and continuously positive results. Well done. Please now welcome Nana and Iqbal to the stage to present the last group of awards. and Shafro. By now, by now you all know me, so please welcome Iqbal, my colleague, who will be introducing to you the last batch of the Issuing Bank Award. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Nana and colleagues. Um, I'm thrilled to be here, and uh, let's now go to Romania, where the award for most active Issuing Bank in Romania in 2022 goes to Alpha Bank Romania. Congratulations. Please welcome Charlotte Rue, Managing Director, Central and South Eastern Europe, on stage to accept this award on behalf of Alpha Bank Romania, as unfortunately Bank couldn't join us today. In their own words, Alpha Bank say, we believe in evolution, we are optimistic, we want people to go no matter how far they go, and we are here to make things happen. We are evolving with you. Congratulations once again. Now we go to neighboring Serbia, where the most active partner bank in 2022 is Adico Bank. Unfortunately, Adico Bank is unable to, un unable to join us, so please welcome EBRD's Matteo Colangeli for the third time to accept this award on their behalf. At Adico Bank, the client comes first and the bank's key mission is the highest possible level of customer satisfaction. Congratulations, Adico Bank. The next award is for the most active issuing bank in Tajikistan in 2022. 
Congratulations to Banke Sata. Please welcome to welcome to the stage fair Zaka. Khata has consistently been EBRD's most active issuing bank in Tajikistan with the status of a nine-time winner under the TFP. As they say, together we prosper. Well done once again. Now we go back to North Africa, to Tunisia. The most active issuing bank in Tunisia in 2022 is Banque de Tulisi, well done. Nu realizeru wobu, translated as we will make your wishes come true. Congratulations. Next, we go to Turkey. In Turkey, the award for most active issuing bank goes to Alternative Bank. Woo! Alternative Bank states their values as approaching clients with frankness, embracing clients, breaking new grounds, working hard and coming up with solutions whenever needed. Congratulations to Alternative Bank. go to Turkmenistan, where the most active issuing bank in 2022 is Bank Congratulations! Please welcome Fatih Turkmenioglu, EBRD's head of Turkmenistan, on stage to accept the award. Rizgal, bank Rizgal is the first private bank in Turkmenistan. Its mission is to be an effective, modern, large-scale part of the economy of Turkmenistan capable of facing global challenges and playing a key role in the implementation of the state strategy to support the country's private sector. Congratulations once again. Next, we are happy to present the award for the most active issuing bank in Ukraine. Congratulations to Ukur Gaz Bank for winning the award of most active issuing bank in Ukraine in 2022. Unfortunately, Bank could not join us today, so please welcome EBRD's alternate director, Artem Shevalev. Since the beginning of war in Ukraine, Ukur Gazban has been endeavoring to become the focal point for international investments aimed to rebuild Ukraine. Ukur Gazban's key mission has been to help the Ukrainian economy withstand the burdens posed by war. The bank's focus has been on financing critical sectors of the Ukrainian economy and restoring the ruined infrastructure as well as supporting critical imports. Once again, well done. For our penultimate award, we travel to our magnificent host country, Uzbekistan. It's our pleasure to present the award for the most active issue in bank in Uzbekistan in 2022. Asakaban! Asakaban continues to contribute to the intensive development of the economy of Uzbekistan and its integration into the international economic community to make banking products and high quality services available to their customers. Well done. The final most active issuing bank award goes to West Bank and Gaza. The award for most active issuing bank in West Bank and Gaza in 2022 goes to Bank of Palestine. Please welcome EBRD Philip Award to accept the award on their behalf. Thank you. Bank of Palestine aspires to become a valued and distinguished financial and banking institution on both the local and regional levels. Congratulations. Thank you, Iqbal. So now we are moving to the award of most active confirming bank of the program. We are thrilled to announce that this year most active confirming bank of the TFP is Raiffeisen Bank International. Sustainability is 
one of RBI's four strategic pillars alongside growth, digital transformation, and cost discipline. Embedded in the principle of responsible banking framework, it aims to help realize their vision for 2025. We are the most recommended financial services group. Well done. Now I would like to take this opportunity to thank Francis Malish for being with us. Thank you. And please welcome again Mr. Kelly Shie back to the stage, who is representing our Taiwanese supporters to present 2022 Deal of the Year. And I'm happy to welcome back to the stage the winners, Arms Swiss Bank Armenia and TBC Bank Georgia. Congratulations. The trade involved an Armenian chocolate factory importing confectionery products from a Georgian confectionery distributor. The SBLCs covered factoring transactions completed on Factors Chains International FCI cross-border factoring platform Eddy Factoring. Well done. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. So, for the second part of our award ceremony, we are honored to have, for the first time, one of TFP's huge supporters and EBRD's first vice president, Jürgen Rechtirenk, here for us, with us, and please welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Is it working? Now it is, actually. Dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, and I would say dear friends, usually I would make a joke that I'm standing between you and drinks, but looking at the table there, I think the drinks already have been served. But thank you very much for staying for what will be the last bit of the award ceremony. And it is my absolute pleasure to be here. And I have to say it is for the first time ever that I was invited. And the reason I hear from Rudolf is, and he is sitting there, Francis thought it was such a great event, he wanted to do it always by himself. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as part of EBRD's strategy to become a majority green bank, something, by the way, which we already have reached last year and the year before, the f trade facilitation program is increasingly focusing on promoting the trade of sustainable goods and services. And as many of you know, Green TFP was established only in 2016 to support investments that deliver environmental benefits. And since then, the EBRD has already supported Green Trade amounting to 1.8 billion euros with around 1,500 transactions in over 25 countries across the different EBRD regions. And add to that, TFP exited from supporting fossil fuels in 2021. And you understand why green TFP particularly flourished last year with a record value of transactions amounting to over 420 million euros, up from less than 300 million a year before. Ladies and gentlemen, green trade finance is also increasingly becoming important to you, our partner institutions. And we believe that our TFP is well placed to help promote green technologies and contribute to the transition to more sustainable economies. To increase support, 
green TFP is always working on improvements in processes, in products, and in capacity building. And we are constantly analyzing, together with Francis and Rudolf's team, um, increasing awareness of sustainable trade finance assessments and methodologies. And this is a challenging path for us. And we would like to express our appreciations to partner banks who are moving towards the Paris Alignment approach with us by awarding them in different categories in green finance. And from our own innovative approach in sustainable trade finance, we as EBRD have been recognized by global finance and global trade review. And in 2022, last year, we received the Sustainable Trade Finance Award by Trade Finance Global, a publication many of you probably know. Um, but now, today, it is for us to give out the awards and accolades. So to conclude, I'm very, very proud to have watched Rudolf and the Green TFP evolve over the years. And we now have winners in categories like energy efficiency, renewable energy, water savings, material savings, sustainably sourced materials, and we even have a special category of resilience and sustainable finance. So without further ado, thank you very much again for joining us, and I look forward to meeting the winners. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jürgen. Uh, before we start, I just want to ask all award winners uh, to stay in the room because after the award ceremony, we will have a, a photo for the Green Awards first and then for all winners. Thank you. So, um, let me introduce the winners now. The award of the most active issuing bank, Green Trade, by booked number of transactions goes to Pireos Bank. Piraeus Bank supported the highest number of the green TFP transactions in Greece in 2022. Congratulations on your second award of the day. The next award goes to the most active confirming bank, Green Trade, also booked by number of transactions, which goes to UBS Group. supported the highest number of green TFP transactions in 2022 globally. Congratulations to UBS. Now we move to the joint awards and please all banks come to the stage when I um, mention your names. The deal of the year green trade in the category of energy efficiency goes to Sanuat Kurilish Bank, Uzbekistan and Odo BHF, Germany. dealt with the import of state-of-art textile equipment from Germany to Uzbekistan. This investment will result in energy savings equivalent to energy needed to manufacture 85,000 pair of jeans. Green Trade in the category of material savings, circular economy, goes to Akpa Bank Armenia and Raiffeisen Bank International.
transaction dealt with the import of plastic recycling machinery to Armenia and will generate energy savings and CO2 emission reductions, but also, and most importantly, reduce the amount of plastic waste, which is uh, very important for the environment. Well done to Aqua Bank and RBI. Now we, go, now we go to the deal of the year, green trade, in the category of renewable energy. I am pleased to announce that this award goes to Alternative Bank Turkey Air. And JP Morgan Chase, sorry. This deal involves the import of photovoltaic panels to Turkey that will generate enough green electricity that would be sufficient to power more than 8,000 electric passenger cars for a year. Congratulations. The next deal of the year, green trade, is in the category of sustainably sourced materials. Please welcome Eurobank Serbia. This transaction deals with Forest Stewardship Council certified paper and other paper products. FSC's forest management standards protect the natural resources of environment and the quality of water. FSC certified paper products are natural and can be easily recycled, preventing the pollution of landfills and oceans. Well done. And now, the deal of the year in water savings goes to, again, Piraus Bank and UBS Bank. This deal involves the supply, installation and commissioning of three innovative liquid waste treatment units, technology that will improve landfill management as well as produce more clean water for irrigation and industrial use per year. Well done. And last but not least, we have a deal of the year in special category of resilience. This award goes to Ukrgas Ukraine and Raiffeisen Bank International. And we ask Irina Tian, my colleague, to collect it on behalf of Ukrkas. Thank you. This transaction supports the upgrade of a biogas plant for biofuel production that can help increase energy security and also help the company achieve their targets for carbon neutrality by 2030 in these challenging times. Congratulations. Can you please come to the stage for the group photo? Thank you. I 
I was asked to announce once again winners of Green TFP Awards. Please come to the stage. Thank you. Please come to the stage so that we have group photo for everyone. Thank you. Gentlemen, um, TFP event is over, but please help yourselves because there is a, a lot of food and refreshments, coffee. Please help yourselves, and we we'll see you in Vienna in October. Thank you.